calling this meeting to uh, order, and I'm going to ask uh, Council Member Sabrina Wooten to give the invocation today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're gathered here in this place at this time, and we're very thankful for the opportunity that you give us to come together to fellowship to discuss matters of this great city. We're honored, we're humbled that you would allow us this opportunity. And while we are here, give us the understanding, knowledge as a body uh, to listen, to understand, um, to open up our hearts, Lord God, to what you would have us to hear, uh, to feel, to do, and to help us to make the right decisions that best suit the people of this community for your will. Again, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for everyone who's gathered here, every member of the community that's represented here. And we ask all these things in your son's great name. Amen. Thank you. Pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic. Thank you. Madam Clerk, do we have the roll call? Yes, Your Honor, all present. Okay, at this point, uh, we're uh, delighted to do uh, the mayor's formal seating and welcome our new member, Delcino Miles, to our family. And Delcino, if you can be so kind to make a few remarks. Nothing like getting put on the spot, huh? Welcome to the club. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I'll put the emphasis on few. I want to say thank you. First, honor to God. Thank you for allowing me to put here, be here. Thank you to my fellow colleagues on this dais who uh, supported me. I appreciate that vote of confidence. And all of you who've been my friends, family, uh, supporters, um, I'm taking a lot of you with me in here, the leadership that you've taught me, uh, the grace that you've taught me. Uh, my mom is here, so I'm extra proud that she's here to witness this. So it started with her. So I just want to say thank you all for your support, your prayers, and your love. And I promise you'll always be prepared. I'm always going to be accessible and available uh, for any questions you may have. But I'm part of a great team of, of leaders and dedicated public servants. So I appreciate this opportunity. I don't take it for granted. I'm here to serve. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you and welcome. Okay, I ask for a certification of the closed session. Do we have a, a motion? Second. Okay, the vote is open. I'm sorry, it's not open. Give us just a second. Uh, <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay. It's coming. Technology is a blessing and a curse. And it's not so fast. Yeah. Vote is right, open. By vote of 11 to 0, you've certified the closed session and be in accordance with the motion to recess. Okay, could I ask for uh, approval of the mo uh, minutes from the informal and formal sessions of August 9th, 2020? So moved. Second. Okay. Vote is open. Not yet, Mayor. I'm sorry, Mayor. You I have know. to give us just there a second. Go. Good. Uh, the vote's open now. Ms. Henley, may I have your vote? Uh, it's not working. Three times already. I can take your verbal vote. Yeah. Okay. It's, even John couldn't get it to do. Ms. Henley, may I have your verbal vote? Yes. Thank you. By a vote of 11 to 0, you've, you have approved the minutes as submitted. Okay, great. Okay, at this point, we are honored to have the recognition of King Neptune and Taylor Franklin and Court we, and uh, George and Gwen McDonald Celebration Chair folks. Will you come on forward? Yep. Okay.
Mr. Mayor, members of council, good evening. My name is Kit Chope. I'm the chief executive officer of the Virginia Beach Neptune Festival, and we're thrilled to present the court of King Neptune the 48th to you all tonight. If you'll indulge me for one moment, I'd like to offer a word or two about Nancy Creech. She's going to kill me for this. Um, Nancy's passion for and dedication to this city, the arts community, and the Neptune Festival is without parallel. The festival staff and I count ourselves truly fortunate to learn from her and to benefit from her mentorship, leadership, and wisdom. And we're so very proud of her this evening, Nancy. So, as the city's official celebration, the Neptune Festival has been providing family-friendly events to celebrate the beach life since 1974. And on behalf of our board and directors and our staff, we thank you all for your continuing support of the festival for 48 plus years. We value our strong relationships with this city, with you all members of council, with members of staff, with the numerous city departments, you were all incredible to work with, and we could not do and produce the 40, 40 events every year without your continuing support, including our symphony concert series, our seniors gala, our beer and wine festivals, our parade Nate K run, our internationally acclaimed sand sculpting championship. I'll close by saying one of our missions is to create economic positive impact for this city. Your investment in this festival provides an incredible return. And as an example, I'll say for every dollar the city of Virginia Beach provides to the Virginia Beach Neptune Festival, the city's economic impact receives $85. That's a one to 85 return on investment. That seems pretty darn good to me. So with that, I'll close. And I would like to introduce my dear friends, George and Gwen McDonald, who serve as this year's celebration chairpersons for the Neptune Festival. George and Gwen. Thank Welcome. You, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, I am George McDonald. My wife, Gwen, and I are celebration chairs for this year's festival. And we're here to uh, introduce you to the 48th Court of Neptune, the best court ever. <laughs> Starting out, Prince Dylan Arlick. Princess Madison Arlick. Princess Nielsen Baxley. Princess Sophie Berger. Princess Ramey Bauer. Princess Reagan Carson. Princess Brooke Cuffey. <coughs> Princess Annika <coughs> Janiscoli. Princess Louise Kinslow. Princess Lauren Marks. Princess Regan McKinnon. Princess Caitlin Mounts. Princess Durant Parker Ash. Princess Brenna Pope. Next, we'd like to introduce the Tritons of the court and their partners. Triton, Stephen, Armbruster, and Lady Ashley. Triton, Jamie Booth, and Lady Krista. Triton, Mark Johnson, and Lady Shonder. Triton, Cheryl McCluskey, and gentlemen, Bob McDonald. Triton, Becky Sawyer, and gentlemen, Greg. Triton, Brian Schools, and Lady Kim. 
members of our court that are unable to present tonight, Triton Jeremy Ingram and Lady Lisa, Triton Ann Douglas Gaynor and gentleman Chad, and Princess Brooke Richardson. Next, it's our pleasure to introduce King Neptune 48, really excited, Taylor Franklin. Welcome one, welcome all. Congratulations. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor and uh, fellow councilmen, councilwomen, congratulations, Mrs. Miles, on your uh, appointment. And uh, it's pretty fun to be here tonight, not asking for an 836 rezoning. I'm uh, excited to be here to uh, represent uh, <laughs> Neptune in the city. Uh, it's been a real pleasure so far this year um, representing Virginia Beach in the Neptune Festival. And a, um, a special thanks to uh, Nancy Creech. This is her uh, last year as the... Uh, chair of the event, and uh, it's an honor to be her last king, and um, I hope I'm doing a great job, Mrs. Creech. And uh, I just want to, uh, <clears throat> yeah, seriously. Uh, this is a great court of uh, young, young ladies and young men and uh, wonderful couples. 48 has been a, a great year and continues to be a wonderful year, and we are all so excited to represent the city of Virginia Beach with its festival. And so thank you for letting us be here, Mr. Mayor, and we would like to present to you and uh, your councilman and councilwoman with uh, Neptune Courts, uh, <laughs> coins, if that would be okay. Oh, that'd be great. Okay, thanks. great. I'm going to hand them out. Thank you. Where can I spend it? <laughs> uh, in kind contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, there you go. And I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce my beautiful bride, Emily. Uh, welcome. Thank you for having us. Hey, thank you all. And, uh, you know, once again, this is a type of event that really helps define Virginia Beach of being the great city that it is. Thank you all very much. Thank you. All right. All right. And, uh, now we have some very significant awards uh, coming up. Uh, Gina, you, uh, Gina, are you here? Okay. Hey, how you doing? Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, Council Members, and uh, welcome to Council Member Miles. Thank My you. name is Gina Gaines Templeton. Thank you for having me back to share with you the eighth installment of Nostalgic VB, our monthly video series highlighting snapshots in our history as we ramp up to the city's 60th anniversary celebration next year. Tonight, let's take a look back at the dawn of the new millennium, which, believe it or not, was more than 20 years ago, which makes me feel old. Here's our video covering 1998 through 2002. While the late 1990s and early part of the 21st century marked the swift rise and fall of the dot-com boom, Virginia Beach was making noise. Jet noise. In 1998, after a sustained four-year campaign by local and political leaders to lure them, the Navy announced it would send 10 of its Florida-based F-A-18 Hornet squadrons to Oceana Naval Air Station following the closure of NAS Cecil Field. Virginia Beach welcomed 156 aircraft, more than 8,000 Navy personnel, civilians, and family members who were projected to inject $308 million into the regional economy and boosts tax coffers by nearly $8 million annually. 
The same year, the city celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Neptune Festival. The event was first conceived as a 10-day street party and seafood festival designed to bring former Princess Anne County and City of Virginia Beach residents together following the merger of the two in 1963. By year 25, the Neptune Festival was enjoyed by more than 1 million attendees. Also in 1998, Virginia Beach opened the nation's first stadium built primarily for professional soccer, the $10.5 million Virginia Beach Sportsplex, which at the time was a home to the Hampton Roads Mariners, a minor league affiliate of the major league soccer team, DC United. The following year, Virginia Beach constructed the first phase of Town Center and broke ground on the $167 million Central Business District project across from Pembroke Mall on June 7th of 2000. In Virginia Beach, the development was kind of sprawled, um, and there, they, the concept of going up was new to Virginia Beach. Uh, we had lots of shopping centers at that time, which filled a void at that time. But as land became rarer um, and development costs started rising, they saw the need to, to move upwards. And so Virginia Beach looked up and they said, this is it, this is what we need to do. This land was here. The acreage was here, the concept was here, and the will and the desire was here. And now we have a beautiful mixed-use development, work-live-play environment. We have the Weston Residences, the tallest building in Virginia. We're at 100% occupancy, um, retail shops, over 20 restaurants. In July of 1999, Virginia Beach unveiled the names of the first 24 people to be honored in the Virginia Legends Walk at the Oceanfront, located at 13th Street. In spring of 2000, the City of Virginia Beach and the Army Corps of Engineers completed one of the biggest public works projects in the city's history, a $103 million effort to protect the oceanfront from storms. The federal government paid 65% of the total cost for the Virginia Beach Erosion Control and Hurricane Protection Project, with the city picking up the remaining 35%. It included a new seawall, a raised, widened beach, a larger dune system, and stormwater pumping stations, all with the purpose of offering an enhanced line of protection for homes and businesses along the oceanfront. In 2001, Virginia Beach purchased the 1,500-acre Stumpy Lake property and public golf course from the city of Norfolk for $13 million. The densely forested area, home to a host of local wildlife, had been slated for the development of a retirement community. The city went to court several times to block the project and instead offered Norfolk a cash deal for the property, preserving the natural open space for generations to come. That concludes our look back at the turn of the century. Our next episode will feature historic moments from the years 2003 through 2007. If you have pictures or videos you'd like to share that capture the early days of Virginia Beach or proud reflections of what makes this city your home, we would love to hear from you. Visit vbgov.com forward slash nostalgic VB for step-by-step -step directions on how to get those pictures and videos to us. We thank you in advance for sharing. Um, the previous seven volumes of Nostalgic VB are available on the city's YouTube channel, Access Virginia Beach. And I'd like to give a brief thank you to our editor and videographer for this project, Anya Linka, and a sincere thank you to the Virginia Beach Municipal Reference Librarians. Um, these rock stars have been with us every step of the way. They've really had to do some digging in this particular episode when we are in the process of going from print to digital was a little bit complicated. Um, but they've been absolutely fantastic and we appreciate all their help. Um, an integral component of the Nostalgic VB campaign has also been to honor individuals who played an important role in making Virginia Beach the fantastic community that it is today. And typically we would just honor two individuals each month, but tonight we're going to recognize three phenomenal ladies, all of whom have made an indelible mark on our city with a keen vision for our future and an admirable work ethic to bring that vision to fruition. <coughs> I invite the mayor to read the first proclamation, and as the mayor gets in place, would Mrs. Nancy Creech please come forward to the podium. Hey, Nancy, come on up. <laughs> you
You know, before I get going uh, with the proclamation, let me just say that Virginia Beach has a proud tradition of more than 50 years since the, it's been you know, started off as the city of Virginia Beach the way that we are. And we've had a legacy of people throughout our history that help define us as a community and always taking us to our next level. And we're going to honor three very special people tonight who have helped make Virginia Beach the great city that it is. And Nancy, I'm proud to read the proclamation where, whereas Nancy Creech <clears throat> has been a tireless community servant, fulfilling numerous roles, many of them voluntary, all with the goal of enhancing the lives of Virginia Beach residents. And whereas she is the president of the Neptune Festival, the nonprofit longtime CEO, and has been actively involved with the organization since 1974. Whereas under her guidance, the festival's boardwalk weekend has become the city's official celebration and the largest annual event generating $23.5 million in economic impact and $1.19 million in annual local tax revenue and was instrumental in bringing Virginia Beach's iconic King Neptune statue to the boardwalk. <clears throat> Whereas she spent more than a decade as a member of the Virginia Beach Planning Commission and was soon after elected to city council. Whereas Nancy Creech has served as a member of the Resort Advisory Committee, Chair of the Virginia Beach Arts and Cultural Advo Advocacy Committee, a founding member of the Sandler uh, Center Steering and Fundraising Committee, a board member of the Virginia Beach Police Foundation, the Virginia Beach Symphony Orchestra, the Governor's School of Arts, of Arts Foundation, Virginia Musical Theater, Light Rail Now, the Hampton Roads, Navy League, Virginia Beach Vision, and whereas she has been honored as the first citizen of the year, great citizen of Hampton Roads, Hampton Roads Woman of the Year, a Virginia Beach champion for arts, Mardi, Mardi Gras Queen, and host of additional honors. Whereas Virginia Beach would not be the community that it is today without Mrs. Creech's vision, leadership, and dedication. Whereas Nostalgic VB is a celebration of Virginia Beach pioneers and residents leading up to the 60th anniversary of our great city in January of 2023. Therefore, I, Robert M. Bobby Dyer, Mayor, along with the entire city council, do hereby proclaim Nancy Creech, recipient of the Virginia Beach Diamond Award in Virginia Beach, and I call upon all citizens and members within the government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses and schools in Virginia Beach to be of service for the benefit and benefit of our community so that the future generations can appreciate the fur and further uplift our beloved city of Virginia Beach. And Madam Clark, if I could ask you to, to come forward and bring this to Nancy. It took me a half an hour to make the loop around the other day. <laughs> Nancy, could you be so kind to bless us with some words? Very few, I hope. Um, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, and congratulations to the new council member, Delcino Miles. I have been before you many times over these years because I'm pretty old. And when you get that old, you get a chance to meet people and work with them, and I've had the privilege of being able to work with almost all of you. I learned a long time ago that council has lots of business on Tuesday nights, and they appreciate brevity. So 
I want to show you that I brought my own fan club, as you can see. <laughs> they are all wonderful, and they are good ambassadors of our city. And I also have brought my family, and I want to tell you the secret to bringing your family is to promise them dinner afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Works every time. I am honored to accept this, but it's not just for me. It's for all of those who come together and work to make our city a better place. Nobody does it alone. Nobody. We may not do things that change the world, but we can be the bedrock of what Americans have always been. Those who pay it forward, who commit their time and their talent to doing something to make better life for other people. So I'm proud and privileged and honored to be just one of those people. I salute them and you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, given the popularity of our three honorees tonight, aren't we glad we have a larger gallery? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And. Uh, Next, I asked uh, Vice Mayor Wilson if she would be so kind to do the honors for Jeannie Evans-Cox. Jeannie, come on up. Now, Jeannie and I have been friends for over 25 years. And I, we were friends when you worked for, for Owen Pickett. We were friends when you went to work with the school system, when I was on the school board. And she's my bracelet buddy. She's a very, that's right. <laughs> we all had matching bracelets. It's a long <laughs> story, but we won't tell, will we? And we've, tra we've traveled to New York together. What happened in New York stays in New York. Uh, and there for her wedding with Bill. And we've laughed together and we've cried together. And she's just a really special dear friend. And it's, it's an honor to read this for you tonight. Whereas Jeannie Evans-Cox has been instrumental in the growth and the development of Virginia Beach, and whereas during her tenure as the Chief of Staff for 2nd District Congressman Owen Pickett, she helped Virginia Beach and greater region preserve its military installations and tenant commands through the Based Closure and Realignment Commission hearings. And whereas she has further served the city and the Virginia Beach Public Schools superintendents of the office crafting school board directed policies and regulating work to secure public transparency and help troubleshoot issues with administrators and educators. And whereas she provided outreach to numerous local communities, including Virginia Beach as the regional representative to the US Senator Jim Webb, focusing on issues including transportation, environment, immigration, federal appropriations, federal grant opportunities, military procurement, and more. And whereas, as the executive director of the Central Business District Association, she has been an unflagging advocate for the Pembroke and Town Center areas. And whereas, Jenny Evans-Cox, or currently serves as, or chairs a number of integral community boards and commissions, including the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area Board, the Virginia Historic Resources Board, the Green Ribbon Committee, the Virginia Beach Rotary Club, the Town Center Advisory Board, the Virginia Beach Advertising Advisory Board, and more. Everybody tired yet? <laughs> Whereas Virginia Beach is thriving and successful communities today is in large part because of the hard work of individuals like Jeannie Evans-Cox. And whereas Nostalgic VB is a celebration of Virginia Beach pioneers and residents leading up to the 60th anniversary of our great city in January of 2023. Now, therefore I, Robert and Bobby Dyer, Mayor of the City of Virginia Beach, Virginia, to hereby proclaim Jeannie Evans-Cox, recipient of the Virginia Beach Diamond Award. In Virginia Beach, and I call upon the citizens and members within government agencies 
public and private institutions, businesses and schools in Virginia Beach to be of service for the benefit and betterment of the community so that future generations can appreciate and further uplift our beloved city of Virginia Beach. And witness hereof, I have Heron to set my hand and cause the official seal of the city of Virginia Beach, Virginia to be affixed the 16th day of August, 2022. Thank you. Now she can get Are back. You sure, that was all. I did all that. <laughs> I'd like to first of all congratulate Delcino, a friend for many, many years. We won't say how many Delcino. We won't count. Uh, but congratulations, and you'll do a great job on council. I know you will. And I certainly want to say a very special thank you to my friend Rosemary Wilson. Um, we go back a long way um, through a lot of things happening in Virginia Beach, uh, both personally and professionally, and thank you for your very kind words. I look at, at the, up at the dais and I see a lot of faces that I've known for a long time, Linwood and John and Barbara and Mayor Dyer and certainly Rosemary and others that I've known for many, many years and we've worked on lots of issues together. Sometimes we didn't always agree on those issues, issues but we worked on them and we worked on them together for the betterment of our city. I had the privilege, the, truly the privilege of working for two very wonderful men and they taught me a lot. And it was an honor to, to do that and to learn all the things from the hurricane protection program um, at the oceanfront <coughs> to Oceana Naval Air Station. I'm a Navy brat too, so um, that was very special to me. Um, to, to save, to help say I didn't do it, but to help save uh, Oceana. And to all the other projects that we worked on. I raised my family here, they're all here tonight. And I have my colleagues from the Central Business District Association here. I'm very privileged and I thank you for the honor. I thank you for the privilege of being able to serve. And I also wanna say that it's a privilege I use the word privilege a number of times. It's a privilege to have a relationship with the wonderful council that we have today. Keep growing, keep going forward, and you've got my support. Thank you. I've asked my fr uh, friend, council member Aaron Rouse, if he would be so kind to honor Louisa Strayhorn. Louisa, come on up. Good evening. Um, before I, I get to read the proclamation, um, to honor Louisa, someone who's opened the door for someone, a young man like myself, I also want to just thank the time to thank Nancy Creech and thank you for your vision and, and leadership with the Neptune Court. Uh, court 47 is the best court ever. <laughs> uh, I, I should say uh, my wife and I had the, the great um, privilege and opportunity to be an ambassador for our city. <laughs> and with that goes along, um, you know, all the responsibilities and Carrie and Kit, I know you, you're going to do a great job. Um, and Carrie always done a great job keeping everybody in line and for the McDonald's to step up, be chairs of the Neptune Court, uh, says something special about the type of people that you are. Um, so I just want to thank the, the Neptune Court as well. And for Nancy Creech, never letting me forget that the Neptune statue at the Oster Front was paid for by private dollars. There was no city money, no city money included in that. But we're here to honor also um, Louisa Strayhorn. Uh, again, someone who at a time where African Americans were, were not seeking public office, someone that put herself on the front lines to open those doors and to break down those glass ceilings, um, step forward and so that a man like myself today can be in this position. So I just want to thank you, um, Louisa. Whereas Louisa Strayhorn has been a trailblazer in local government, particularly for women of color. And whereas she was the first black woman to serve on the Virginia Beach School Board, and well as, as well as the first to be elected to the city council. And whereas during her tenure on the city council, Strayhorn was a staunch advocate for schools, 
public transportation, and an equitable distribution of public resources. And whereas she championed the needs of residents of SeaTech and worked to push forward the construction of the SeaTech Community Recreation Center. And whereas Louisa Strayhorn conceived of and was instrumental in establishing Virginia Beach's Minority Business Council. And whereas after serving on the city council, she continued to promote equity and diversity by leading the Virginia Department of Business Assistance with a mission to increase the number of minority and women-owned small businesses contracting with the state. And whereas she has dedicated much of her career to serving the people of Virginia Beach and beyond, including chairing the Urban League of Hampton Roads and serving as executive director from one hand to another, which supports learning programs for underserved youth. And whereas Nostalgic VB is a celebration of Virginia Beach pioneers and residents leading up to the 60th anniversary of our great city in January 2023. Now, therefore, Robert M. Dyer, Mayor of the City of Virginia Beach, do hereby proclaim Louisa Strayhorn, recipient of, of the Virginia Beach Diamond Award in Virginia Beach. And I call upon the citizens and members within government agencies, public and private institutions, business and schools in Virginia Beach to be of service for the benefit and betterment of the community so that future generations can appreciate and further uplift our beloved city of Virginia Beach. In witness whereof I hear, I have unto set my hand and caused the official seal of the city of Virginia Beach, Virginia to be affixed the 16th day of August, 2022. a few words, please. Thank you. I'm so glad you asked. I just want to say to you that times have changed. This is a city council that I am very proud to stand in front of. I really appreciate the idea that we have representation for all of our citizens on this council, but not just one. Many, and I appreciate, Delcino, that you are on the council now, and I congratulate you, but I congratulate every single member here for doing what I consider the right thing of making sure this is an equal representation on this council. So I thank you for that. Now, I want to thank the members of this city council for honoring me during this city celebration, but I humbly thank the citizens of Virginia Beach who voted me in as a member of this council and for granting me the opportunity to be a city leader and to make a difference. I have to confess my interest in utilizing public office as a path to my community began in Boston with a lie. That lie was a lie of admission to my mother since I attended a protest march against Boston school board members, particularly Louise Day Hicks. She had been a leader against desegregation from 1962 to 1965 during my public school days and expressed her outrage and disapproval of any integration of Boston by busing of black students into neighborhood schools in every way possible. It was the first time I had experienced hatred from public officials, and I knew I had to join the demonstration. I told my mother I was spending the night at my best friend Peggy's house. However, I did not tell her we were participating in a protest. Since my mother was very concerned for my safety and she had forbidden any public participation um, in anything that could turn ugly, I have to tell you, I had never lied, until that day, lied to my mother or disobeyed her, and I never did again. We would have been fine, and I would have been safe if the rioters supporting the school board members' racist platform had not set the dogs on us, fired shots at protesters, and injured many people. Naturally, that brought the police, which brought the press, and you can probably guess, my picture was featured on the 6 o'clock news <laughs> oh, Lord. and uh, the next day in the newspaper. That was certainly only practice for participating on Virginia Beach City Council since we always seemed to be in the news. 
given my punishment for my lie of omission was something I remember even now. I learned to do my best to always tell the truth since then. However, since we did finally desegregate Boston schools, I saw the positive result that came from working together to end injustice and to help other people. When I came to Virginia Beach and was asked by neighbors to represent them, I agreed and experienced one of the most rewarding opportunities to help others that I have ever had. I serve with many of you who I'm sure remember that that period was never boring. Thanks for making my service alongside all of you so exciting. I hope we will all work together to ensure all the citizens of Virginia Beach will have equal representation. So in closing, I thank the citizens of Virginia Beach for believing in me, and I am grateful to this city council for honoring me this evening, and I thank you all very, very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> You know, it's, a, it's an honor to honor three magnificent people that help uh, make Virginia Beach. And I am confident that the restaurants are going to get a financial boom tonight. <laughs> uh, thank you all very much. Okay, at this point, I'm going to go into the speaker's policy. I want to remind everyone that the city council speaker policy that allows certain representatives of groups to speak for 10 minutes applies only to planning items. All other speakers, whether speaking individually or on behalf of a group, will have to come up to three minutes to speak on a single item. Speakers are reminded that comments during the formal session of the meeting must be limited to the subject of the item that is being considered by the council at the time you are called. For items placed on the consent agenda, a speaker will have up to three minutes to address any single item. If a speaker wishes to address multiple consent items, speaker will have a cumulative total of six minutes to address those items. Again, the speaker must limit his or her comments to the subject matter of the items they have signed up to address. Finally, I call upon all speakers and all persons in the chamber to be civil in their discussion and decorum. Whatever views you hold and wish to express, the city council wants to hear from you and to ensure that all viewpoints and all persons are respected. The best way to do this is for us to strive for civility and respect. Okay, Madam Clerk, are there any uh, speakers on consent items? Uh, yes, sir. Barbara Messner. Good evening. Ms. Messner, the items that The items that you will not be speaking on at the everything you'll be speaking on everything else except for J one. Okay. J one. Everything except for J one, J three, and J four, and then K one and K two. Okay, because I listened to uh, everything else except okay, that, for that's J. The opposite of what y'all said in Ma'am J. The only things you won't be speaking on right now are J one, J three, J four, K one, and K two. Those have been pulled. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so those are the four I can speak on. Okay. Resolution to amend um, the dome site. You know, I forgot to bring that. We've been, ma'am. That's that's been pulled. That's one okay, you will not pulled. be speaking on right now. Okay, that, that's why I marked it. Okay, so two. All right, transfer eight hundred and thirty-nine thousand nine hundred and seventy-six capital CIP. Judicial Center Maintenance, uh, Judicial Center Parking Security Upgrades, um, Branch and Holcomb. And 
I'm kind of surprised because I thought Mr. Holcomb was still with the sheriff's office, which is a conflict. But since this, um, you know, pertains to security, I want to remind you that building two was not secure. I see that a trailer at the aquarium is building two, which is shocking. And as I've said before, stop corporate welfare, relocate the king of nepotism to the bottom of the sea. And since y'all ask Mark Stiles, you know, for conflict rulings, he gives his opinion. He's hired by y'all. The only legal rulings are with the Commonwealth attorney who has stated his, uh, he's had to abstain. Okay, and what, is, what are the other items? Everything except three and four? <clears throat> Okay, execute a second amendment purchase of between the city of uh, and Princess Anne Hotel, LLC. The city should not be in business with private developers um, on anything. Six, ordinance to declare approximately 4,693 93 square feet city property, uh, Market and Columbus Streets, excess of the city's needs. Why don't we need property for the citizens? Why isn't it on the tax rolls? And why are you selling it? Uh, we don't need any more hotels. This is for 20 additional hotel rooms. Okay. Okay, extend the date for satisfying conditions, um, 317 45th Street, right of way. Um, you know, I oppose, you know, giving extensions to other people, but not for the citizens. Okay, 10, appropriate $90,000 from the Oyster Heritage Trust Fund, Public Works Operating Budget. Oyster shell recycling. Ms. Wilson, I'm sure you remember when you started the penny tax to help create Pleasure House Point. You know, they, they're, they're supposedly a nonprofit, and they should be uh, paying for this, the oyster shell recycling. No, nobody can get oyster shells for themselves. If you didn't pollute and overbuild on the ocean front, we wouldn't have uh, all these uh, sea life dying, okay, and transfer 136,494 from the 22-23 budget to the aquarium. Raise security services. Take care of the school children, keep them safe. This building, <coughs> this Taj Mahal is ridiculous, and Mr. Moss ran in 2011 on fixing Princess Anne High School, but he you know, cared more about the arena for five years. So, um, yeah, conflicts. Taylor Adams, how can he be a, a city manager and director of uh, economic development? Branch Wilson, they sell... Uh, Branch has a hotel. Wilson sells resort condos. She wins the awards. They're on all the marquees that she sells more than anybody else. Isn't that interesting? Um, and as far as conflicts, these are the outside law firms on top of the other law firms that we have. You know, Guy Tower. He makes a lot of money, you know, with his uh, shares and stock, which is on the city's website. From 2005 through 2012, and um, Wilcox Savage, 
It's the one Mr. Stiles came from. And I didn't hear why um, the city manager wasn't here, why Mr. Chandler was here. Thank you. <coughs> thank you for not interrupting me. Thank you very much. And thank you. And for reporting, uh, clarification, Mr. Duhaney is uh, away on city business, and Mr. Cat Chandler has kindly you know, consented to sit in in his stead. Okay. Anybody else? Um, no, Court? sir. That's that's the only um, one side okay. that for consent agenda, uh, agenda items. Miss Wilson, if you can kindly do the consent. And yeah, under ordinances and resolutions. Under ordinances and resolutions, uh, number two, the ordinance to transfer $839,976 to the capital project number 100225 Judicial Center Maintenance regarding Judicial Center parking security upgrades. And then number, number five, the ordinance to authorize the city manager to execute a second amendment to the purchase agreement between the city and Princess Anne Hotel LLC at the intersection of Princess Anne Road and Community College Place. Number six, ordinance to declare approximately 4,693 square feet of city property at the intersection of Market and Columbus Streets in ex excess of the city's needs and authorize the city manager to enter into a purchase agreement for the sale of to the TC Hotel LLC regarding construct 20 additional hotel rooms. Number seven, the ordinance to authorize the acceptance of a dedication of approximately 0.619 acres of vacant land located at Leroy Road from Urban Associates, Foxfire, regarding green space buffer. Number eight, ordinance to authorize temporary encroachments into a portion of city-owned property known as Lake Joyce and the 20-foot strip of city property around Lake Joyce located at the rear of 4528 Back Cover Road regarding construct and maintenance, riprap, timber rope, boat ramp, landscaping timber, existing wooden dock, block bulkhead, and wood bulkhead, and concrete boat ramp. Number nine, ordinance to extend the date for satisfying the, con the conditions regarding closing a 334 square foot, por foot portion of an unimproved right of way adjacent to the rear of 317 45th Street. Number 10, ordinance to appropriate uh, 90,000 from the Oyster Heritage Trust Fund to the FY 2022 23 Public Works Operating bar Budget regarding oyster shell recycling. 11, ordinance to accept and appropriate $51,700 in lieu of park reservations from Enclave at Victory Subdivision Development in CIP 100299 Park Playground Renovations 3. And number 12, ordinance to transfer $136,494 within the FY 2022-23 Virginia Aquarium Operating Budget regarding security ser services. I open a, a hearing on planning. Uh, <clears throat> number three, William M. and Joni P. Green, co-trustees of the William M. Green Revocation Revocable Trust and co-trustees of the Joni P. Green Revocable Trust for a conditional use permit regarding alternative residential development at 1900 Landing Road, District 2. Number four, Jennifer and Joseph Bailey for a conditional use permit regarding short-term rentals at 303 Atlantic Avenue, Unit 1404, District 5. Number five, Nicola Georgiev for a conditional use permit regarding short-term rentals at 303 Atlantic Avenue, Unit 402, District 5. Number six, Philip A. Fletcher for a conditional use permit regarding short-term rentals at 303 Atlantic Avenue, Unit 1400, District 5. Number seven, Lori and Stuart Goldwag for a conditional use permit regarding short-term rentals at 2002 Baltic Avenue, District 6. Number eight, Yurski Faragalia for conditional use permit regarding short-term rentals at 314 29th Street, Unit A, District 6. 
And number nine, an ordinance to amend section 401 of the city zoning ordinance CZO pertaining to small scale agricultural processing as permitted uses in the agricultural zoning district sponsored by council member Henley. Move for approval. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? The vote is open. Mm -hmm. Mr. Moss had a comment. Oh, you, uh, Mr. Moss. I'm sorry, by a vote of 11 to 0, you've approved the consent agenda as read by Vice Mayor Wilson. I wanted to uh, address a more positive aspect of item 5. Hopefully, Councilmember Moss, can we have your turn your microphone on? Thank you. I'd like to make a more positive comment about item 5 and hopefully get concurrence that we would do this, this computation in the future. When the computation was done for the benefit of this property, it did not take into account the delta between the cost at which we acquired the property and the cost which we, the revenue that we received for the property. And the significance of that is, and I want to thank Kevin Chandelier for this knowledge. I, I asked the question, but he had the answer. If you look at the current calculation, not talking about the revenue we gained on the price of property, the payback period to the general fund doesn't occur till year five, a net credit, even though other allocations to uh, dedicated funds and the school allocation formula is paid off in year three. But if we included the revenue gained, as any business would do, the profit we made on the property, this would be a more positive outlook of what we have achieved. And I think in the future, we should adopt our policy to reflect either the gain or the loss on property as part of the calculation. I just share that with you. I think that was a good news story. But I just want to clarify in six for the viewing public, the land that we are declaring excess was land already covered under a CUP that the hotel had to maintain, landscaping, sidewalk, all these at their own expense. What they gained by the excess declaration is the ability to gain air rights to bump out their facility above what any property the public would use and would have the right to use in perpetuity. And so we really didn't give away anything in terms of public use and public improvement. So it really was a, a reasonable <coughs> uh, trade. I just want to make sure that was well known. Good point. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Tower. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to comment with respect to item J1 to note that I have a letter on file in the clerk's office with regard to um, Kaufman and Canole's representation of the uh, venture group in this matter and my former relationship with that firm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Moving on. Okay, if we can go to uh, ordinances and resolutions. Number one, a resolution to amend Exhibit A, Paragraph 3 of RES number 4132, approving the execution of the First Amendment of the Dome Site Development Agreement or a allocation of performance grant between phases of the Atlantic Park project requested by Council Member Branch. Any speakers? Yes, sir, to the first speaker is Barbara Messner. After Ms. Messner will be Nancy Parker. Those of you who've been here for any length of time know that the Dome has had many incarnations. Um, you've changed the name, the project, and it's our you're using air parking lots. You know, those are our municipal parking lots. And Dominion Energy. The... Anyway, you know, y'all have been playing around with this. It's a surf park. We're on the oceanfront. It's mixed use. It's going to be HUD money. It's going to be entertainment. Every inch of this friggin' city is entertainment. It's ridiculous. Not to mention the traffic and the parking. Th that fancy vehicle you have driving all over vehicles to take people, give people rides. That is outrageous. There are people who need rides to the doctors, rides to the grocery store, and you're moving people around in the resort district only. That is discrimination. There's so many things that are discrimination 
and then you lure people to the ocean front where there really isn't parking. Um, as I stated earlier, I listened to Taylor Adams talk about uh, a couple things, but Taylor Adams, Mr. Rouse, Ms. Wilson, you know, y'all weren't even here for July. You were in Spain schmoozing and bringing foreign companies here, and they get grants. That's not your job. It's not your job to entertain. It's not your job to decide what goes at our oceanfront. Um, and what you've done with the elections is totally, okay, totally outrageous. Okay, please stick to the point, ma'am. I am how y'all vote. This is Branch. He has a conflict. He has a hotel. He's at the South End. I regret helping him run for hotel motel. Had no idea what he was after. Okay, so is that the only one? One, correct? Okay, that's the only one we're talking about now. Okay. Like I said, I've sent y'all pictures of the parking and pictures of trash, the dumpsters. You know, I heard Mr. Bellucci talking about his uh, neighborhood being upset with, you know, wild bars and everything. I've had 300 people in my front yard in my neighborhood. We've had cars crash into um, the brick walls of churches. So it's pretty interesting at election time when y'all pay attention. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker is Nancy Parker. Welcome. I always have to say this, but we should recognize past people who served her. This is the Honorable Nancy Parker, who served on this body for 16 years, I believe. Yeah. Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. And this is awesome. This is my first time here, and it's really an incredible facility. So congratulations. Good job. Well done. <laughs> Mayor Dyer, members of City Council, and welcome, Delcina, uh, Deputy City Manager uh, Chandler, as well as City Attorney Stiles. As the council shifts funds to help finance the Atlantic Park, I ask with all due respect, who is looking after the financial peaceful well-being of the surrounding residential communities? At the Resort Beach Civic League meeting last night, which Councilman Tower as well as Branch attended, as well as this, uh, Deputy City Manager Taylor Adams, Venter described the updated project and answered questions. It was apparent there is still a lot a lot of unease about the sound of impact, the impact of sound on the residential communities. The study dated July the 14th, 21, and the cover letter March 28, 2022, specifically limited sound impact to the areas bounded by 17th to 21st Street, 22nd Street, and the border back to Mediterranean, and omitted the issue of the heavy bass sound waves. It was admitted last night, we will have sound. The question? How much? At night, primarily, I have crickets, and during the day, circadias and the occasional jack go by. On the alternative compliance granted August 9, 2022, to U.S. Surf Company for a skateboard venue, both the council as well as the planning commission added the condition, the operation shall not disturb the tranquility of residential areas or other areas in close proximity, otherwise interfere with the reasonable use and enjoyment of neighboring property by reason of excessive noise, traffic, lighting, or overflow parking. I do believe there is a win-win solution if we approach this issue from a different perspective. It sort of came to me this morning when I woke up. Does the music need to blow all the way to the boardwalk at 95 plus DBAs or DBCs, whichever you choose? This venue only has 3,500 seat indoors and 1,500 out. The Veterans Amphitheater has 20,000 seats outdoors with much greater acreage. I assume they throw at least a 95 plus DBA also to cover all that space. Why does this 75% smaller venue need to do the same amount of coverage? When a measurable set, what we need is a measurable set and definable and enforceable decibel levels that keep the sound within the boundaries of the Atlantic Park venue. Think about a glass of water. How much more water do you need to pour in when it's already full and flowing over the table and onto the floor? 
The folks on the outside are not paying customers. There is no revenue. If sound levels of the magnitude as suggested in the study. Thank you very much, Nancy. Appreciate it. Did I run out? Yeah. Yes, but couldn't she be allowed to submit her written comments to the Yes, board? yes, she can. If you would do that, Ms. Parker, I would appreciate it. Sure, and I cut. I just want to make one last. There is a term used for the th th thank collateral you. damage, and we don't want to become collateral damage. Thank you very much. I appreciate that's, that. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay. At this point, do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Discussion? Yes. Yes, Mr. Morris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wasn't involved in the earliest stages of how this project matured at Atlantic Park for <clears throat> conflict of interest reasons, but ultimately Dominion Resources was out of the picture and as was Exxon gas station, which allowed me to join this project. And I've appreciated all my conversations I've had with uh, the venture team. And I was always committed though I would not have voted for this project if I could, but to make the project that was approved at the time work. And so that's why I sponsored the CDA legislation in cooperation working with Delegate Barry Knight. And also while I found a funding solution that worked for this body on the utility corridor for $17.9 million. I, I mentioned that only to tell you what I have done to try to make a project work. But there's a, something not being talked about tonight it's not just moving 1.75 million approximately from phase two, because we did vote, and I support that, breaking it up into two phases, which changed the performance revenue allocation. So now we're gonna have $4.75 million over each year for 20 years for phase one, that's one point, and then a balance. But clearly it was indicated that when we get to phase two, the residual performance revenue is gonna be a bigger ask when the time comes. So we should be making this decision based on what we think that upper limit of the bigger ask is. And if that were the case, would we still vote for it? But we're not having that public debate. We're just ignoring the future. So we have a lot in common with our colleagues in Washington. Um, the other piece that's here is in the beginning, this project, when it started, never re a music hall was not part of Venture's initial proposal. And my colleague is correct, Mr. Branch. It was the city manager, then city manager, and then Ron Williams, deputy city manager, who foisted and made Venture include a music hall in their project. It did not originally have an operable wall, meaning it opens up and lets people sit on the lawn and see the stage and hear the noise, but that did come later, and that was briefed, and questions about parking. You could say all good things. But now the music hall, which was considered an ancillary issue, has become the keystone in the arch of financial stability and feasibility for the project overall. And that's okay too. But this council made a commitment to the community. I'm not saying every member who's here today, I'm not gonna put that burden on people who weren't here at the time, that there would be no additional noise impact on those neighborhoods. And that testimony didn't just come from me. That testimony was shared with us by the city manager and currently Mr. Adams in a briefing to this body. So those aren't my words. Those are the staff words of what took place. Now the noise study, which is now public, and the annex tells that there will be a noise impact. And I guess from Mrs. Parker's comments, that was acknowledged last night. So the real question is, by doing this, we're basically already committing, because council's given the direction that the manager can approve the lease agreement. So that'll never come, the lease agreement with Live Nation, which will never come to this body for approval. You'll never see it voted on, but provides no accountable protection measures for the public or this body to enforce on Live Nation as to the noise that we said they wouldn't endure. I asked at the time, and everyone here will hear, hear me say it, that we should be voting on that lease first, but we've delegated that away. So we've made that decision. We've decided that this deal, doing this, is more important than keeping our word. I'm not judging what other people will do because they don't work for me, they work for you. But I'm telling you, I'm not voting for this change because we are not keeping our word. And I think when we give our word, it should mean something. It undermines public trust. 
And to say that we couldn't breach that, really, I think people think we should keep their words. Now, is that a small group of the public? And well, people in District 9 won't hear that noise. But I remember when the amphitheater opened, we had to had noise. And what we had to do, we had to build a pretty substantial berm wall at that amphitheater. Well, there's no room at Old Beach to build a big berm to protect their neighborhood. So we need to be careful that when we're voting for this, because we've already gave direction to the manager to approve a lease that doesn't provide enforceable, accountable measures for the neighborhood, that we are enabling the breaking of our promise. I don't judge what other, how other people will vote, but I want the public to know why I've supported other aspects to make this deal go through, but I cannot break my word to the public, and therefore I'm not voting for this item. Okay. Anyone else? I don't see any hands. The vote is open. Mr. Tower, Ms. Thank you. Vice Mayor Wilson, may I have your vote? Thank you. By a vote of nine to, was there eight, eight to three? Eight to three, I'm sorry. Um, this ordinance has been adopted. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, we're going to move on now uh, to item number three, ordinance to award a $5,000 community service micro grant to Kenneth Dorsey Jr. Foundation raise support of back to school supply drives, free haircuts and free mentoring and tutoring services to the Virginia Beach students requested by Council Member Moss. Uh, oh, sorry. Speaker. I'm sorry. Do, you, do you want me to call speakers first? Yep. Thank you. Uh, the first speaker is Barbara Messner. After Ms. Messner is Sarah Gerloff. I have all the videos, all your promises, Mr. Moss. Uh, which were taken down when y'all shut down my Facebook pages. Okay, micro grants, and it is super majority. Um, I have the document from um, Yearn, John Yearn. You know, it's super majority. It's nine votes whenever you're talking big money in city land and, and city projects. It's that's for the record, and people can look at. <coughs> Okay. Yeah, this has been on the agenda before. Five thousand dollar micro grant. Um, back to school supplies. Like I said, Moss ran in twenty eleven, saying he was going to fix Princess Anne High School. That's been taking pictures since twenty thirteen. That's so blighted. And here you are in this fancy building, and talking about other places. Public safety first. Uh, this $5,000 grant, um, you know, for free haircuts, the city should be separate from the school board, 100% separate. And if the children are supposed to go to school, uh, then everything should be paid for. it. There shouldn't be any um, dream academies with special interest funding them on on property, like SeaTac Elementary. You know, you can't use our public schools for dream academies and let special interests, you know, work with them. You need to take care of the kids first. And um, this community grant is, is nothing. Let the kids go to the rec centers for free and open up some land and some buildings for the USO, so the, the military have something to do. Thank you. The next speaker is Sarah Gerloff. And after Ms. Gerloff is Latonya Snow. Good evening. Good evening. So first off, nothing is free, and there is no such thing as government funded. The working, the hard working middle class taxpayers pretty much pay for everything, making it all taxpayer funded. 
So this ordinance would award taxpayer dollars to a special interest group. Even though this foundation appears to be doing something good for Virginia Beach students, why do politicians get to decide which special interest groups should receive our money? This city is already over $3 billion, billion in debt and does not pay our legitimate employees fair wages to keep up with the inflations that you politicians are creating. How can city council afford to give away our money to any special interest group? When schools, usually when schools ask parents to help kids with supplies, many parents in the community will step up. The schools could then work together to distri distribute the supplies where needed. Why would we need a middleman or politicians involved? We do not. Let's talk about those tutoring services. Over the years, I have noticed an increased need for tutors. Why? Well, I have also noticed that the public schools are spending more and more time training kids to use on the use of preferred pronouns, LBGTQ acceptance, and to be social justice warriors instead of teaching the basics like reading, math, science, and history. Kids spend seven hours a day in school, which should be more than enough to learn the basics. But now they need to spend additional time and money um, to be tutored because the public schools are failing. These kids are our posterity, the ones we are to protect. They are our future. It is not difficult to see the upside down world the politicians have been creating when you look at what is and has been happening to our children. And by the way, out of curiosity, I recent look, recently looked up the definition of politician. The definition is one who deceives or outmaneuvers others for personal gain. Let me say that again. One who deceives and outmaneuvers others for personal gain. Pretty fitting these days, I'd say. At least one definition is spot on and has not been changed yet, you ridiculous politicians. The last speaker is Latonya Snow. Good evening. Doing? So I agree with the grant. Of course, I agree with the grant. Um, but as I told you last week, $5,000 doesn't put a dent into what we need done for longevity. Um, so I'm here, again, on behalf of Shayla, Xavier, and Donovan Lynch, because we need trauma therapy. Um, the kids are getting haircuts, they're looking nice for school, and tutoring is great. But as far as when we deal with what's going on in their community, Right, we have teachers who reach out to the kids, but we need to reach out in our community. So I'm just here again. I'll be back, and hopefully, you know, we can make a program for longevity. We can't do band aids. Once the five thousand dollars runs out, what's our plan? So come with a plan, and until then, I'll be back. But let's come with a plan. But we appreciate the band aids. We need real programs. Okay, y'all have a good night. Thank you. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay. Was there a motion in a second? Well, I guess my my wife will be wondering where all my gain is <laughs> when I go home. You got she'll some explaining to do. She'll be asking me where it is, but I don't think uh, my balance sheet would reflect I gained anything during my. Is your mic on? I don't want people to hear my paper, so I turn it off. I, well, that comment was I don't. My wife will be asking where all that personal gain is when I get home, because uh, I don't think anybody up here has prospered from their. Uh, honorable service to the community. Uh, I enjoy this job, but certainly there's been no personal gain, so I'm glad I don't meet that definition of a politician. But I feel all of us up here are truly public servants. We may disagree from time to time, but, but we all have the best of motivations. That's what I believe. And I would move for its approval. Okay, we have a second. Aaron. Second. Am I gone? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councilman Moss, for, for bringing this forward. I know this, this serves as um, something that is extremely often overlooked in, in communities, um, particularly where there are a lot of you know foundations who do like to give back to school supplies. But haircuts are something that <laughs> typically gets overlooked, and that's speaking from experience where my mother used to cut my hair until I went to school with a bowl cut one day, and uh, <laughs> I never heard the, the end of it. And so 
um, programs like this um, help to ensure that our, our students who can go to school, not only are they well prepared um, to go to school, but they also, you look good, you feel good, you have a sense of pride in yourself, and then tutoring. Um, the last thing I would say is that our public schools in Virginia Beach are not failing. And I actually think they're doing a great job, and a lot of people move to our city for the schools. And so to our school board members, um, all of them, um, to our superintendent and the teachers and educators who are gearing up for the school year, um, thank you for your work, your effort, and your commitment to our students. And uh, we continue to look forward to, to supporting you. Thank you. Aaron, did you give the second on this? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Rocky, second. Mr. Mayor, I take offense to that. I wore a bowl cut all the way to 10th grade, and I, and I wore it with pride. Well, now, you, now we know you stepped up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're all showing our rage these days. Uh, okay, anybody else? The vote is open. Vice Mayor Wilson, may I have your vote? Thank you. By a vote of 11 to 0, you approve the ordinance. Okay, thank you all. Okay, moving on to uh, number four ordinance to amend uh, Appendix J. Agricultural uh, Repose uh, Reserve Program, ARP, Section 4D Rate Processing of the Animals as Allowed by the City Zoning Ordinances. We have two speakers. The first speaker is Barbara Messner. After Ms. Messner is Stephen Johnson. Agricultural Reserve Program, ARP. You know, Barry Knight is in the Millionaires Club for Agricultural Reserve Program. A lot of other people, we had the Green Line. Anybody who's been here for a while knows what the Green Line was. We're supposed to preserve, you know, none of this towers, you know, all, the, all this stuff in uh, TCC area. Um, Processing of animals as is allowed by city ordinance zoning. Amend. Do you have any idea how hard it is for the public works people? Sometimes they get sick because of the, the filthy trash that they have to pick up. And to allow um, animal processing, you know, in agricultural uh, land with all the flooding problems, you know, mitigate, mitigate is, you know, you know, 567 million for the first phase. And if you look at it, I didn't bring that chart. Some of it's 60 years down the road, you're still planning. That was the biggest scam. You're talking about referendums this afternoon. We don't need any referendums. The people who care about the city, they write you, they show up here. And you should listen to us. We don't, we don't need referendums. It's a little bit late after you spent 10 or 20 million fighting the Holloway case, which I didn't agree with anyway. But um, yeah, some of the people that are in the Agricultural Reserve Program and vote on it, um, then they can sell the land to developers. So I'm, a, I'm opposed. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Stephen Johnston. Good evening, Stephen. Good evening, sir. Oh, man. A slaughterhouse and processing facility is not wanted nor needed here in the city of Virginia Beach. The ordinance allows up to the slaughtering and processing of 20,000 chickens her sight. And that's just a foul proposal. The proposal, <laughs> the proposal only allows for the slaughtering houses in the ARP. The ARP is intended for open spaces, not, to how, not for housing, not for retail, and certainly not for an agricultural processing facility. Slaughtering and 
<clears throat> processing of chickens is a danger to our environment, especially to our groundwater. There are multiple examples of contamination of groundwater, chemical spills, and spills of other types of uh, biological material from byproducts from the processing of chickens. I Googled it. There were over eight pages on Google of just examples of how many, how bad this is. A few, a few years ago, Creed's Elementary School was forced to use bottled water for everything in the school. The groundwater had been contaminated. The city was never able to find out what contaminated all the only resource they had was they drilled deeper wells to, to supply the school. If our groundwater is contaminated in the southern part of Virginia Beach, can the city afford to pay for the piping infrastructure required to provide drinking water to our residents in the southern part of the city? Processing chickens uses a lot of water, assuming it's groundwater. In Virginia Beach, we've got flooding problems. It's two pro, two, a two-fold problem. One, the sea levels are rising. And two, the city is sinking. And it's sinking because we're pulling a lot of groundwater out that's holding the city up. And as we increase this groundwater, uh, increase the pulling of the groundwater out of the ground, it's going to increase the, the sinking of the city, increasing our flooding problems. And we're going to be right back where we were a few years ago if we don't address this now. <clears throat> the question is not if, but when there will be a contamination spill at one of these small plants. OSHA it does not man these plants every day like they do the large processing plants on the eastern shore that still have spills. <clears throat> and, whether, and while the odds are low, like a nuclear power plant like Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima, the damage will be just as well. If we contaminate our groundwater in the southern part of the city of Virginia Beach, it will become uninhabitable for people unless we supply them with piping infrastructure. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, Appreciate sir. it. Thank you. That's all the speakers, sir. Are there any questions? Oh, any I move, questions? I move approval. Move Second. approval. Second. I have a few questions of staff, Mr. DeHaan Mike. I just have a few questions of staff. Is agricultural uses withdrawal from groundwater exempted from the state requirement that all groundwater choices require now a permit from the state? Councilmember, I don't know the answer to that sitting here specific to the groundwater requirement. It's my understanding, though, that they are required for, uh, I do know for regular residences, they are required to obtain a permit from the health department, but we can, we will double check that. Well, I'm not referring to the health department, but I know there's been a big move afoot by the state to eliminate groundwater use and to get people on municipal water everywhere, and they really have been resistant to granting new permits for groundwater, and that's why HRSD is spending a lot of our money to put water in the ground. So I'm just curious, if this is a high volume water usage, or whatever that is, and it's a commercial, it's a, a commercial purpose, it's agricultural, I'm just asking, are they exempt from the state regulations requiring uh, groundwater withdrawal permits? Well, We'll get you that answer, that answer, council member. Um, I would but, like to know that going back, because I could see how people could operate efficiently and keep their stuff cleaned up, but the water withdrawal rate is something that the state itself is trying to, and did we take that into a factor in assessing this, your endorsement? Uh, this proposal, the, the numbers that were provided in the, in the small-scale processing were pulled from the FDA requirements of what's considered a small-scale um, agricultural or bona fide um, activity. So the numbers didn't just come out of thin air. They did come out of what was considered um, a small-scale. I'm not processing. suggesting that the small-scale definition part, I'm referring to the water withdrawal consumption over the maximum Area that if we adopt this, the number of places that could have it. If you looked at the per per site, what's the aggregate impact that could be? Yes, I'm sir. just asking, was that assessed? No, no sir. We we would not have assessed that at this point. But I'm I'm familiar with the state level conversation you're talking about. We'll get you an answer on that. Just um, uh, uh, our our 
our evaluation of this was a uh, this is this is a needed use by our agri agricultural community, specifically on the beef side. We do enter, where where slaughter would not be allowed, Bobby. Is that correct? The the only potential use for for slaughter would be uh, would be on chickens, and we don't even think that may be possible. We, that's a uh, but but this is a needed use, and we'll get, but we'll get you the answer as quickly as possible. Just for the whole because I don't like voting in ignorant, but I don't want to be prejudicial, so I'm going to just abstain. I don't have sufficient information either to approve or to disapprove. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? All right, seeing no hands, the vote is open. Mr. Stiles, was my declaration sufficient to comply with the state law for the reason for my abstention? Thank you. Mr. Tower, may I have your vote, please? Thank you. By vote of um, who's of, uh, nine to zero with Mr. Tower and Mr. Moss abstaining, you've approved the ordinance. Okay, thank you. Now we'll um, open a hearing on planning and uh, item number one, Winners Properties LLC, the Running Mead Corporation in Evergreen, Virginia for modification of conditions for a car sales and service, 3700 and 3736 Antero Way, District 3. First speaker is Billy Garrington, representing the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Vice Mayor Wilson, Mr. Berlucci, members of City Council, on behalf of winners, I'm here tonight with Kyle Corte to ask for your approval of this conditional use permit. Mr. Berlucci, <clears throat> first thing we want to do is thank you for how free you have been with your time. We have used up an unusual amount of your time, and you have been very free with your time, and we appreciate that very much. I'd like to also thank your staff, <clears throat> Carolyn Smith and Waddell. We have used up a lot of their time, too, Mr. Mayor, and we thank you for hearing this request. And as you know, this request has been before you before. The changes to this request that are here tonight stem from the fact that originally the new dealership was going to be built on the three-acre wooded site that's to the west of the existing Hyundai dealership. The second proposal that we brought in front of you was going to use a third of that for parking, and the rest of it would remain as wooded. Both those steps are now off the plate, off the board. We are now building the new dealership entirely on the 11 and a half acres that the Hyundai dealership is on and has been since 1997. The property in question was given a conditional use permit in 1997, again in 2002, 2003, and 2013. So everything is taking place on that existing property. The site next door to it is not going to be utilized in this case at all. There was a number of problems that we had with this when it first came up, it had to do with on-street parking on-street parking issue has been taken care of. Had to do with lighting problems. They're working towards that, and I think they have been corrected also. There was significant noise out there. There was a problem with the offloading of cars in the city right away. All of these issues that once they brought were brought to our attention and got to the right people at Checkered Flag, those issues have all been cleared up. You still have some issues out there, and you probably will as long as you have people living next door to a commercial operation. But I'm here to tell you that when those those items are brought to our attention, they get handled and they get handled in, in the proper fashion. There's one other issue that we haven't spoken about here, and that's economic development. If you look at this dealership that's going to be built, you look at how, ni how nice it's going to be, what it's going to do to the real estate taxes, the jobs you're going to create for the construction of the new building, all those building materials are going to be bought from local building contractors and supply houses in the area. So it's a win-win for everyone. But we do have to be a good neighbor. We realize that, and we are working towards that goal now. So the request that you have in front of you, the staff report, we are in agreement with. We went to the Planning Commission even when we were utilizing part of the property next door to us, and the vote at Planning Commission was 10 to nothing. So. We think we have a good product, a good case in front of you tonight, and we're here to ask for your approval of this request. So Thank you. I want to save as much time as I could for Mr. Corte. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Corte, did you, would you like to make comments? I'll just get the opportunity later to answer any questions or provide feedback if necessary. Yes, sir. Fran Sansone will be the next speaker. Ms. Sansone, I understand you're, no, you're fine. I understand, ma'am, you're representing the Princess Anne Plaza Civic League. Is that correct? Okay. 
You take your time. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Put that there and see if it stays. All right. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor and member of uh, members of council. I'm Fran Sansone, the secretary of the Princess Anne Plaza Civic League. <coughs> Excuse me. Before starting my comments, I was going to ask some of our members and residents to stand and be recognized. I understand some of them weren't able to be here, so they're watching either on Channel 46. I think some are going to uh, speak via WebEx as well. So we still have involvement. There they are. There's some more of them. We have a couple over there. Thank you all. Um, last December, I spoke on behalf of the League to share our serious concerns about the request for a conditional use permit, or CUP, by Winters Properties, also known as Checkered Flag, for a new Hyundai Genesis auto repair facility and showroom. These plans included developing on the three acres of heavily wooded land, commonly referred to by residents as the Centeraway Woods. You ultimately responded by delaying your vote for 60 days to give the dealership time to review and resolve prior cup violations that specifically affected residents. We anticipated that the time extension would result in the correction of violations and hoped that concerns with stormwater runoff and potential flooding could also be addressed. Another extension was ultimately given and with the assistance of Councilman Berlucci, substantial interaction between residents, league representatives and dealership representatives began to take place. We had meetings, including one with Mr. Snyder in April, and began working through good neighbor issues and the resolution of specific cup violations. Winters Properties even made design changes, which moved the new showroom closer to the east side of the property and further from homes. We were shown a plan that also expanded the parking lot to cover approximately two of the three acres, and residents and league members still continued to hope that Winters Properties would preserve as much of the woods as possible. Recently, we learned that Winters Properties decided not to move forward with showroom plans for the, decided to move forward with showroom plans and not at this point in time pursue developing the acreage, but would still purchase the wooded acreage. With regard to request for Winters Properties, Running Mead and Evergreen for the modification of conditions regarding their sales and service on Centera Way, the league supports their building of the showroom on the east side of the property. Of course, it's expected that they will continue to work with the residents to resolve cup issues that are affecting the quality of the neighborhood, quality of life in the neighborhood. The league continues to have multiple concerns with losing the woods, whether it's now or in the next couple of years when develop, development continues. Heavy rainfall, which would be stormwater runoff and potential flooding if trees are removed, will affect the larger portion of the community as a whole. And while the 10-year window to complete projects that significantly improve water management in that area, it's still in its early stages. We are seeing improvements <coughs> thanks to the current stormwater projects. On August 5th, the uh, city's Department of Planning and Community Development mailed out a flooding preparation flyer to uh, residents within the Windsor Woods and Windsor Forest area who had owned property that had previously flooded. This notice was followed a few days later by about four inches of rain in that neighborhood in two heavy downpours. It just serves as a reminder that one inch of rain on one acre generates about 27,000 gallons of water or over 81,000 gallons of water on those three acres. Consequently, that four inches of rain would be equal to over 325,000 gallons of water. And those are calculations that are derived from the U.S. Geological Survey and U.S. Department of Agriculture Forest Service. That rainwater becomes stormwater runoff when there are no trees to slow or filter that water. It remains a part of the League's responsibility to reasonably advocate for the community as a whole. That also includes our wanting winners' properties by being within our league boundaries to be a successful, thriving business. Checker Flag recently ran a, a, a print ad in, in the Jewish News. This is on the back, full page ad, noting, quote, community, their community roots and devotion to giving back to the thousands of customers by partnering with educators and community services to create economic opportunity and to improve health, education, and most importantly of all, inspire civic engagement and service. We'd like to help everyone in our community live their best life. Winner's property, checkered flag, has certainly inspired 
our civic engagement. That's why the League and residents have been involved with this project since last December. We want our community members to live their best lives now and in the years to come. We also want winners' properties to be successful and hope to work with them for a very equitable resolution involving the last three acres of woods in the Windsor Woods, Windsor Forest area, as well as correcting the remaining cup violations. Thank you for hearing our concerns. Thank you very much. You're welcome. The next speaker is Barbara Messner. After Ms. Messner is Arthur Terlecki. I can't help but, you know, mention how y'all vote and how you care about public safety. And just because two of you voted um, for the slaughtering of animals, ignoring the health issues, doesn't mean that you're not liable because you should have been informed and you should have voted no. Um, I've been here when this group has spoken before and I've spoken against this. Runnymede. They have the t both town bank towers that the, that the city leases space along with town bank and Berkshire Hathaway uh, town mortgage. And if anyone's read about the tampering with the mailboxes at T Sea Pines, Kemsville, all these other places, Sea Pines owns the blighted property that used to be um, the annex for the post office. Now it's one of the breweries that you subsidize. The brewery subsidy is obscene. The alcohol push is obscene. But the problems with the, um, the blight of sea pines, and it's the same person, Runnymede, Lewis Fine uh, Law Firm family, um, they're not protecting us. They, they can't even put up um, closed circuit cameras, which they should have, because it's, everything's rusty. How many of y'all have been to sea pines since it's been on the news about uh, the mail theft? It's been... Their mail has been stolen from, and they even, uh, it's been ripped open since TV3 and TV14 have uh, reported on it. <clears throat> Ms. Wilson, you live down there. Mr. Branch, you live down there. Do you care about air mail being tampered <coughs> with and who the landlords are? Thank you. The next speaker is Arthur Trelacki. Then after Mr. Terlecki, it will be Eve Terlecki. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. My name is Arthur Terlecki. I'm a neighbor in the affected property in the residential area. Um, so I'm a little confused because I see there's two properties listed on the current item. So one is 3700 Centera Way, which is the current dealership, um, Hyundai. And then 3736 is the wooded lands. So... This is a modification of conditions to both properties. So is that only affecting one from the, what the lawyer said, or is that going to be affecting both? So I guess that's one question I have, because from my understanding, they're not supposed to uh, touch the 3736. So um, as far as everything, the neighborhood, I don't think has an issue with building the dealership. I mean, you know, we have to expand, you know, essentially we have to do better. We have to build our businesses. Otherwise, you know, Virginia Beach would fail as a community. And residents have to realize, you know, that we have to work with businesses. So as far as the 3700 Centera Way, we have no issues with them building the property, building the new dealership. Now, building on 3736, we've pretty much been stonewalled. Uh, lawyers may say, you know, we've come to agreements and terms and stuff like that. But essentially, they keep presenting us with plans and they modify it to their benefit and not to the neighborhoods, which mainly was the trunk free, I mean, excuse me, uh, the frontal tree view of the property where they wanted to build a road into it, pretty much get rid of the existing driveway and move the driveway down 100 feet, getting rid of the frontal tree view. So I think that's the only thing, you know, that we really have an issue with. We don't have a problem with the dealership building their Genesis building, but the only 
conditions that they've met were to the existing CUP and not to the next CUP that they're requesting. So that's pretty much all I have. So. Okay. Mr. Thank Mayor, you very much. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Michael. Trelecki, if you don't mind, uh, since you did pose a question at the beginning of your remarks, mm -hmm. if, if um, Mr. Tahan, would you mind addressing the question that he asked just so we can clear that up right now? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Bellucci. The applicant uh, has provided an adjusted site plan showing no impact on the property on 3736 and Tearaway, and all of the improvements are being proposed on the existing property. Okay. Okay. Right. Sounds good. Great. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Next speaker is Eve Terlecki. <clears throat> then after Ms. Terlecki is Bogdan Terlecki. Welcome. Um, my name is Eve Terlecki, and I spoke before a few times already. Therefore, today, tonight, I won't speak about um, pollution, about noise, about lightning, about how we should live, what they supposed to do, or whoever supposed to do. Um, I won't say nothing about the frustration because I spoke about it. I we talked about this before, but I think so. Each of us would like to live in quiet neighborhood. We have also not be, not only the neighbors. Uh, living in the residential area, but also the center, the nursing home, the people over there who nurses helping those people in the wheelchair and then um, uh, people from um, dealership, they are driving the cars, they are not watching for the people. You know, they are turning, they are, they are going into the property of the center of this nursing home. Each of us has a family, the parents, grandparents, sister, mothers, brothers, or even friends. And I think so in that the nursing home has also uh, not only the rehabilitation, the people who are using the wheelchair or the cane, or um, but also um, the people who want to die of a day quietly, who doesn't want to live in the quiet place, not commercial. Maybe some of you will say, but before you bought this house or built this house, you knew it is a comer commercial area. Yes, it was a very small. You couldn't see it. I live across from the wooded area. And therefore, I choose this, this, this lot because I couldn't see nothing. But before, um, the dealership didn't ask no one before if we want, they can expand, ex build more, bigger property. They just did. Right now, since few months ago when we received the letter, therefore we knew they want to do it again. And therefore, you know, we want to live in the quiet residential area, not commercial. Would you, any of you, live in the commercial area? Probably not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Bogdan Terlecki. After Mr. Terlecki will be Peter Burning. Good evening, uh, Bogdan Terlecki. I'm, I live right across. As you know, I spoke before. Uh, and uh, what I have to say is uh, our neighbors and, and supporting people I uh, spoke already about everything. I don't need to repeat, but uh, uh, we know that, well, since, since we, have, we, we have this case since last year and uh, a lot of stuff improved and uh, I'm very pleased uh, with your work, which you did uh, for us. But uh, there's some more problems. On 12 of uh, this month, uh, 
I, we had an incident of vehicle uh, speeding several, make a several passes from the dealer. Uh, and uh, uh, they went around the nursing home area there where people walk with the walkers, uh, residents, and uh, uh, that's dangerous for them. Uh, I have a video of it. And um, uh, I can let you to see it. But uh, I know when uh, we're going to uh, approve this project, uh, of course, it's going to be even worse after a while. When the people put their foot into the door, uh, they're going to have all the rights. And later on, we're going to have, of course, uh, buyers of the new vehicles on the lots. So I oppose this project again. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. The next speaker is Peter Burning. After Mr. Burning is Sandra Schinnebarger. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. My name is Peter Burning. I live on Presidential Boulevard, which is just across the street on Centera Way from uh, the dealership here in question. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I support the updated proposal that, is, that has since been modified from the Planning Commission. Um, the location of the dealership next to the Jackrabbit storage, I think, is, is a great solution that, that we've come to over these past few months. Uh, secondly, I'm grateful for the engagement checkered flag has provided through the representatives in working with our neighborhood toward this solution. It's a great improvement uh, from the original design proposed last year. However, um, if you decide to approve this proposal tonight, I ask that you include a stipulation that the applicant uh, be, be in full compliance with the existing conditions prior to the beginning of any improvements or construction. Uh, this business has been in violation of several of the conditions placed upon them for this property by this council, sometimes dating back to 1997. Um, finally, with the last minute change to this design, I'm unclear about some of the specific changes that will be part of the conditions. Uh, specifically, condition 14 addresses the long-term status of the parcel to the west. So uh, while we've seen the updated site plan, we've not seen updated conditions that reflect that change. So there are, there are probably some um, updates that need to be made prior to final approval of this uh, proposal. Um, and to echo what my neighbors, the Cherlekis, have said, uh, today, I know it was late, I don't know if you got a chance to see the video that Mr. Cherleki took of um, checkered flag employees racing up and down Centera Way testing uh, recently repaired vehicles from the dealership. They pull out onto our onto Centera Way, at, uh, which is a 25 mile an hour zone, rev up the engine, speed down the street, make a sharp turn inside the nursing home property, um, very close to where some of uh, the residents there come out to smoke just off the property line. I think they're not allowed to smoke on the property. And they sit right there in the street in their wheelchairs with checkered flag employees racing up and down the street, testing these recently uh, repaired cars, which um, I feel is very dangerous. Anything that's recently repaired or needs testing probably shouldn't be driven that close to residents, uh, nursing home, as well as our backyards. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Sandra Schinnebarger. After Ms. Schinnebarger is Kat Porterfield. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Dyer, members of City Council. I, I wanted to point out this is a nice opportunity for the car dealer to show consideration for, well, for their own in inventory, their employees, and the neighbors, including in the upcoming months and years. I, um, there, it's a nice business opportunity to display integrity and for that integrity display to actually be true and accurate. Um, I. I have, I support the, the amended, um, well, the updated version, um, but I also think they would, I, w I really wish they would consider investing in a plan to, um, 
protect their own inventory from known flood risks, risks in the area and build upwards. Um, here's a reminder of one reason we now have a $567 million flood bond. Um, this was fairly, relatively fairly recent um, where this happened in both 2016 and just from rain in 2018 where there wasn't even a storm. Um, that's the Windsor Woods neighborhood. Um, so also I wanted to mention on the updated application, I noticed that page 10 still states, there does not appear to be any significant natural or cultural features associated with this site. And that's after knowledge of um, when we had mentioned in December that we had a petition that had approximately 2,500 people that signed regarding the flood mitigating woods on Sentara Way. Page 11 on the application is missing some significant discussion points with neighbors and civic league members where it conveniently omits several neighbors' objections um, and doesn't mention the flood mitigating or fume filtering woods at all. Page nine, item six, um, now this is according to VDOT, um, number six um, regarding the tree removal, that was violated on several occasions since 1997. And we, we can forgive all that. Um, anyway, the point is one can only hope that this business will decide to correct some of these um, issues and um, continue to show some integrity in the upcoming months and years where, um, and then hopefully that integrity remains accurate. So we're hoping they don't um, come up next week or next month or next year and still decide they want their parking lot from, uh, you know, wh where the woods were. So, thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Kat Porterfield. After Ms. Porterfield, we'll move to the WebEx speaker. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good Okay, so the plan we have before us is a compromise from uh, the prospective buyer still, right? They still, Runny Bean still owns the property. But our standards on the preservation of green space and a turn away from reckless development need to be exacting. There's no room for compromise. And yes, I believe in personal property rights and the right for someone to develop a piece of property, but I don't, and neither do you, believe that that should come at the detriment of people or the environment. And there's a possibility that once this property is in those hands, that that's what, what may happen later down the line when people aren't paying as much attention. Uh, but I also believe in personal responsibility, and that's also something you probably agree with me about. But when Running Mead purchased that property in 1996, and for the 26 years they have owned it, they had a responsibility to know what was happening there. And while they weren't paying attention, the local BMX community was, and the park they built inside those woods drew not just local but international riders. They stayed in our hotels while they were here, they ate in our restaurants, they shopped here, but most importantly, they inspired our young local BMX community, a community and a park that became the training ground for Justin Dowell, an Olympian silver medalist from Virginia Beach. But now the BMX community has been chased out of those woods with the promise that the city will find another place for them. Where or when remains to be seen. But meanwhile, we have a mayor and an appointed council person who have this grand vision of turning Virginia Beach into an extreme sports destination and have inked an agreement to bring a Canadian extreme sports festival to the beach and apparently do not see the irony of approving the paving of our own homegrown extreme sports park because a prospective owner of that parcel <laughs> wants to put luxury automobiles there. Winter doesn't own it yet. Runny Mead still does. And there's something Runny Mead, with the help of this council, could do to make it right. There's a solution out there that can make everybody happy. Well, everybody but the guy who doesn't even own the property yet. But the residents of Windsor Woods, the residents of the neighboring care center, a red-tailed hawk or two, and the generations of kids coming next who may aspire to be another Justin Dowell, they would be thrilled. Please consider purchasing this property and working with our own local extreme sports community to make it into everything they have dreamed it could be over the last 25 years and probably more. So I implore you tonight to make that consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, we have one WebEx speaker, Kim Mayo. Ms. Mayo, you are unmuted and may begin. 
So I'm Kim Mayo, and I'd like to restate my support of property rights of neighbors and the Princess Anne Plaza Civic League, and also in support of us taxpayers bearing the burden of costs of flooding caused in part from reckless overdevelopment. We, the people, will always be paying attention. I'd also like to briefly express my condolences on the passing of Mr. Jones, my district rep, and welcome Council Lady Miles. Um, we are all well aware of the neighborhood is ground zero for flooding and those terrible impacts. Under no circumstances would removal of that forest be a good idea. The modified proposal is a wonderful opportunity for the city and the fines to put all of Windsor Woods into conservation. I have some related experience outside of Virginia Beach and they would be well compensated. The city has 2.5 million, it's my understanding, in open space funding with access to millions more from national conservation groups. Virginia Beach has 50,000 acres of forest, 20,000 not conserved. This land is made for you and me in part because it was made for us, it's up to us to preserve it. This land was made for you and me because it was made for us. It's up to us to preserve and protect it. Development growth should always be confined to existing footprint. So thank you checkered flag for expanding on pavement and cleaning up your violations. Let's create a win win and ultimately preserve the beautiful woods for all to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Corte. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. My name is Kyle Corte. I'm a lawyer that uh, handles certain matters for winners' properties and the checkered flag dealerships. I just want, on behalf of my client, I'd like to express my appreciation to the city staff, uh, Karen Smith, Waddow, uh, Mr. Berlucci, and the members of the community that really worked uh, and spent countless hours and their resources, their time, and finding a solution that I was pleased to hear the Civic League can support tonight, certain members of the neighborhood could support tonight. And I think it's a, it's a resolution that um, I'm pleased to put forward. And I hope that it will be agreeable to everyone on council and that you'll be in a position to support the application. And I welcome any questions or. Any questions? OK, thank uh, Mr. you. Mr. Mayor, I do have yeah. a question. Sir? I have a question for Mr. Corte. And uh, I'm going to make a few moments, a few comments in just a moment when I make a motion. But I'd like to ask you a question now while you're here. Yes, sir. You heard a little bit about, you heard a lot, you've heard a lot actually over the course of the last year about the, um, some of the impacts that the operation of the dealership has had on the neighborhood that is adjacent to it. And um, we have a list of revised conditions. I believe there are 29 um, conditions contained within the document as amended. Um, and also there's been a lot of discussion about issues such as noise, light, car carriers, other things, many of which are contained within this document. So I, I want to take the opportunity to just get on the record um, that you can represent with confidence that your client will be able to and will adhere to the conditions that are contained within the application as well as relevant city code that relates to their operations. Uh, the short answer to question, yes, absolutely. Uh, the longer answer is a lot of the issues that were raised, I think we can uh, thank this process because the management at the dealership, both on site and, and at the higher levels, uh, they were not aware of a lot of these complaints, whether it was the lighting, the noise, uh, the landscaping folks blowing stuff onto the street. Um, from top to bottom, they had not been made aware of it. And I, I think uh, it, would, it would, could be fairly said by everyone that's been here tonight and everyone that's been involved in the process that when those issues were raised, uh, the folks at Checkered Flag stepped forward and they did a, a fabulous job of addressing it, finding a solution that worked for them, allowed them to operate the, the business, but at the same time address the concerns of, of the community. And I'll, I'll take your representation as to the amount of the uh, uh, stipulations and requirements that are here today. I, I, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, we previously agreed to them and we'll stand behind that assurance and, and stand behind them going forward. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll, I'll speak to that in just a moment, but I will agree with you that Checker Flag has been responsive and um, reactionary to the concerns that are raised by the neighbors, and I'm very grateful for that. I know they are as well, although I do not speak for them. I, in conversations, I, I, the, uh, many people I've talked to have expressed and recognized the responsiveness of Checkered Flag, and yet it's a business, and operations continue, and, and, um, and at times there's friction between 
um, the peaceful enjoyment of the community and the operations that exist within the, within the car dealership. And that's why conditions exist. And that's why I just wanted to make sure um, that we're standing before everyone in agreement that um, the dealership will is, is able to and willing to adhere to the uh, conditions contained, as well as issues like city code um, <coughs> that speaks to car carriers unloading on the street and um, speed and other things like that. And that they are able to comply and they, they intend to comply. And thank you very much. And Mr. Mayor, I don't have any questions for you, Mr. Corte, and I do have a question for Mr. Tahan, though, if it would be appropriate. Sure. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tahan, I don't want to, for the moment, spend a lot of time on the, uh, what we let's call it the Runnymede property, because um, that part has been um, removed from consideration for now, for, at this time. But I do want to make sure that we're um, just being transparent and open with the public about what that property is, uh, who owns it, and how it's zoned. So would you mind if I ask you just a few questions about that? Uh, the property that's adjacent to this property, could you describe the current zoning? Yes, Mr. Bellucci, it's zoned B2 already. It's B2 zoning. So what are some of the permissible <coughs> uses under the existing zoning for a private owner? Uh, B2 zoning is one of our more permissive districts that allow typical retail restaurants and other similar uses, offices, um, uh, of course, there are other uses that require conditional use permits that are more intensive, but there, it is our typical business uh, zoning district. Thank you. And um, so uh, uh, theoretically, anyone who owns a piece of property that's zone B2, if they want to develop that property, what would that process look like? Uh, they would need to obtain an approved site plan and uh, move forward with their uh, obtaining all their necessary permits. Thank you. So, and the reason I'm asking these questions is that I just, I know that the folks who are have been involved in these discussions, um, like the Princess Anne Plastic Civic League and directly adjacent neighbors, are well aware of, um, of, of those facts. But I want to make sure that everyone in the public is well aware that, um, you know, in spite of the fact that Checkered Flag or Winners Properties has removed um, that parcel as for consideration today, that the, the use of the property is, um, is still um, could be a buy right use that could include those items. And do you know if there's an existing site plan for that piece of property? Yes, sir, Mr. Bellucci, there is an existing approved site plan for that property. Do you have any idea when that was approved? Uh, that plan was approved on, I'm sorry. Oh, shucks. I'm sorry for putting you on the spot if I That's did. okay. April 17th. Uh, 2020. 2020. So that was approved before the existing stormwater regulations that are more restrictive were um, in, in, were are in effect. That is correct. Yeah. So how long would a um, property owner have to develop under an existing site plan? They would typically have five years, so they would be able to uh, develop under their current site plan until April seventeenth, uh, twenty twenty-five. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Those are all the questions I have. And Mr. Bellucci, I'm sure Mr. Dahan has been put on the spot a few times. <laughs> Thank you, Bobby. Okay, do you have a motion? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would I'd like to move for approval the revised um, application that uh, we received uh, recently as well as that inc is inclusive of the revised conditions. Second. And, second. Upon receipt of a second, second, I'd like to make a few comments. Okay, any other uh, discussion? Okay, Mr. Bellucci. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, it's everyone knows that we've spent a lot of time on this application, and I just want to take a moment. There's a lot of thanks that need to go around here, and I want to start by thanking the members of the Princess Anne Plaza Civic League, the um, folks who uh, live directly adjacent to this property, and uh, to all those parties who live near there and are part of our neighborhood who have raised concerns. Um, you know, we heard Mrs. Creech talk earlier tonight about um, one of the most special things that happens in any community is when concerned citizens, people who love our community, dedicate their time and talent to make our community a better place. And I think the process that we've seen play out, although challenging at times, is a great example of um, the spirit that Mrs. Creech described. Checkered Flag, no doubt, is a um, community pillar. It's an organization that we all value, that I have a lot of value for, and I think they do a wonderful job. Um, they're, uh, they operate an incredible business. They um, 
many, many, they employ many people, and um, I aspire to buy one of their nice cars one day. But it's, um, this has just been challenging because it's been a friction point. And Mr. Burning described it very accurately as a friction point several times throughout this conversation and these discussions. And it's just a place where a uh, business that operates is um, located directly adjacent to a neighborhood. And so, um, and so there have been challenges in sorting through what's the best path forward. I also want to compliment Checkered Flag and um, Mr. Corte and, and um, Mr. Garrington for representing Checkered Flag. I think it's true that all parties involved um, have a great and high regard for our community. They love our community, and um, and we all want <coughs> to uh, to you know to be successful here and to have peaceful, quiet enjoyment of our home. So I think there's a lot of good has come of this. There'll be discussions <coughs> another day about the property that's adjacent to it, but I just want to compliment all involved in it express my sincere and um, heartfelt appreciation for your advocacy, which has no doubt uh, made our community a better place. So um, with that, Mayor, I will um, welcome any additional comments or the vote. Okay, Mr. Moss. I just want, I just want to thank the <coughs> Fran, I believe it was. Matter of fact, I went to school with her brother uh, a long time ago. But anyway, just for the acknowledging that while we haven't got to the full projects yet, but that the dredging that we've done with the canals and the work that we have done is really showing, uh, has really had a big impact on the flooding that they are experiencing. And we're soon gonna be awarding one of the big chunks of those projects to get started in the Flaza area. But I do appreciate the acknowledgement of the good work that you've done, but also that the council and our staff has done to improve the drainage in the Plaza and Windsor Woods. And I know Michael's on top of that all the time. Thank you very much, Brian. Okay, anyone else? Looking there and on the left. On the right, the vote's open. By a vote of 11 to 0, you've approved the application as uh, amended. Thank you. And, uh, you know, before we get to the next um, item, I think one of the goals that we have in an elected body in the way we serve Virginia Beach, we try to get to a win-win with everybody. And uh, Michael Bellucci, I just wanted to thank, thank you for your steadfast, dare I say, tenacity in getting to yes, but also proving that the collaboration of working with an elected body, with the city staff that's motivated to help, and a community with concerns that we could all come together. And so I say kudos to all of you. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, and here we go. Um, number two, Witch Duck Real Property for Conditional Zoning and uh, I-2 Heavy Industrial District to Conditional A36 Apartment District or a construction up to 430 multiple family dwelling units and density of 37.72 units per acre at 122 Max Street in District 4. The first speaker is John Mamoudis. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, we're the last item and uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can get through our, our uh, speech to y'all and, and move on to good things here. Uh, Mayor, thank you, and uh, all the council members. I've been before this board many times in my career, starting in 1981, and I proudly say that, uh, Ms. Henley, you voted on my first to rezoning when I was 23 years old, and you approved. I got an approval, and I walked out of the meeting going, now what do I do? <laughs> so I was young and naive, but it turned out well, and I appreciate all your service through these years. Uh, I represent Witch Duck Real Properties, which is the quote unquote, concrete mountain that's in the city of Virginia Beach at the Witch Duck Corridor. We all see it when we pass it every day. Uh, we wonder how it got that big. We wonder when it's gonna go away. And uh, through some uh, initial conversations with a friend of the owner, I was brought into this because the owner had some issues with the city. Uh, a long list of violations and has gone on for 
30 plus years in regard to the operation and how they've morphed and gotten bigger. As they've gotten bigger, um, extra issues popped up, then they turned into violations and et cetera, et cetera. But I will say in defense of the owner of the property, uh, when, he, when he bought the property, the, the town center development was not there and a lot of things have come to him. But being a, a good citizen and trying to do the right thing, he called me and said, well, I got all these violations, what should I do? I said, fix them. And I hung up, there was nothing else I could tell him. Well, that, you know, come and went. And then we had some dialogue about how to stop this uh, continuous um, cycle of problems with the neighbors and the community and the business community complaining on a constant daily basis. Uh, I came up with an idea. I said, tell you what, I'll buy the property myself. You just get going. And we started a structure to do that. In the middle of that, I was approached by the breeding companies. And um, I wasn't sure what my task was going to be in solving that initial problem for this fella and being involved in it. So I looked at the items of uh, violations, and I looked at the uh, breeding companies with all of their credits and all of their quality and everything they've done. I said, why do I want to go in here and build this project and try to solve the vi violations here? I can't do it. I took the what I thought, I thought at the time, the path of least resistance to settle the violations. I think I would have now switched with Breeden on that. But we're getting that fixed. We are getting that fixed. I personally was on a bulldozer last week fixing the right way out there. I wish you all would ride by there and see how green and beautiful it is. Uh, that being said, we have a mountain of concrete there that needs to go. We're working on it diligently. And here's a, something that I think is interesting. How many owners of property tear their buildings down before the contract is satisfied and he's closed on the property and collected his money. Very few. We have convinced the owner of the property to do the right thing. Bring this property down, take it out of the circulation of the violations, make it a situation where a top-notch developer company and the breeding companies can come in and enlighten and make that end of the western end of the town center uh, something to be seen. I have all the confidence in, in Breeden's capabilities. I took on the role of getting here, solving the problems, involving consultants, the quarterback, so to speak. I couldn't have done it without the staff. Marshall uh, Coleman, our planner, would tell me no in the nicest way, and I felt good about it. I've never had that relationship before. But I, we, That's uh, the definition of a diplomat. Yeah. Exactly. Taylor Adams, I went to Taylor, I went to, uh, uh, I went to the uh, Development Authority. We took this idea of getting rid of this big problem, but coming in with a great solution, being the bookends of the town center. I'm sure when Mr. DeVars back in the day had some ideas about how this was gonna go, he, he took witch duck all the way out and probably thought it all would get done. Well, we're going to be the one, hopefully with your approval, and we're going to be the one, I hope, that starts, that jump starts this whole, um, whole western end of this deal. Uh, we're here, and with all the, I got the staff here. Lisa Murphy is our attorney. She's going to come up and, and talk about any particulars and the highlights of, of the development. Uh, and I just, if you have any questions beyond what I've said here today, I'll answer them the best I can. But I'm, I'm kind of like half city, half developer here because I've been trying to get this property online, but the task is easier to clear it and let it go. And I made that decision early on, and I think it's going to be the best for the city of Virginia Beach. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Lisa Murphy, and after Ms. Murphy will be Barbara Messner. Hello. Good evening, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, uh, members of council, and especially our newest council member, uh, Councilwoman Miles. Uh, for the record, my name is Lisa Murphy, local zoning attorney, and I'm here today on behalf of, uh, or speaking in support of the zoning application, but on behalf of Breeden Investment Properties. As Mr. Mamoudis uh, mentioned, Breeden is the contract purchaser, so you'll see the uh, materials that were provided, the building elevations, the site layout, design, all indicates that it's Breeden Investment Properties. 
In deciding whether or not to rezone land, it's critical really to look to the city's comprehensive plan, which is, as you, know, as you all know, an aspirational roadmap for how the city, uh, how we as a city choose to evolve and grow, not only for the present, but for the future generations. Um, John said it, he nailed it. This is a highly visible 12.26 acre property. It's located in the Pembroke Strategic Growth Area in an area referred to as the Central Village District. So the vision that the city has for this part of the city is not what is currently there now. To be blunt, a hodgepodge of unsightly industrial uses is not part of the city's vision for this highly visible strategic growth area. In fact, this particular location is so visible from the interstate that most people know it as the giant concrete pile. It's the subject of frequent complaints from citizens, multiple zoning violations, as John alluded to, and ongoing litigation. As the staff report indicates, the proposed 438 unit multifamily project embodies the envisioned characteristics of the city's strategic growth areas and properly integrates the development guidelines for multifamily residential development stipulated in the Pembroke SGA and in the comprehensive plan special area development guidelines for urban areas. In fact, the proposal reflects the vision of urban style development with open space features, uh, pedestrian, pedestrian oriented uh, structures and improvements, walkability to other desirable locations and amenities, high quality design and attractive building materials and landscaping. This project, which would be developed by Breeden Investment Properties, would be another extremely high quality multifamily apartment community with five five story buildings and one building uh, six stories. It would have podium parking with the units on top. Just this morning at the Development Authority's monthly meeting, Deputy City Manager Taylor Adams reminded us that the constraining factor in hiring and in uh, economic development right now in the city is housing stock. We need a wide spectrum of housing to entice young people to come to the city to live, work, and play. Our businesses need employees to grow and prosper. We have too many businesses now chasing the same employees. Um, to answer your question about affordability, this is market housing, but as we increase the housing stock, we're going to effectively decrease the prices. There'll be much more supply. So this will help add to our supply of housing uh, for all citizens. A traffic impact study was provided after the Planning Commission meeting. Uh, the, as, uh, basically, the proffer identifies uh, nearly spot on what the traffic study indicates oh, is necessary, and, and the applicant or the developer has agreed to do that. I'm happy to answer questions. Any, any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, John. Could you share with us the analysis that you've done to know what the inventory of market rate apartments are and what you forecast where the knee and the curve is and where your project contributes so we know when this falling prices are happening based on supply? Because mm -hmm. I haven't seen anyone who's out there and I constantly get solicitations to invest in premium products and the return rates are huge which is why that's why banks are willing to lend the money. So you've made an assertion that's going to happen. Can you provide the evidentiary analysis that supports that? So I can tell you um, uh, just from experience, and I can have the, the market folks come up and tell you, but um, I'm a Gen Xer. There are very few of us. There is a wave of millennials that is far larger than the wave of baby boomers. And as far as the housing stock we have in the city, the current supply that we have, whether it's single family, multifamily, duplex, um, there isn't sufficient housing stock to supply the need for all of the citizens and to recruit citizens. So, uh, no, so to just, fill those jobs, we're going to need. I can talk about we're going to need citizens. Uh, John, John, John. If I could. Let her finish. Well, I heard. Wait, yeah. So we'll, we're going to need to be able to recruit folks to come here to fill the jobs that we can't currently fill, and those jobs are across the board. I mean, we've got businesses. They come to development authority, they can't meet their milestones because they can't, they can't bring on employees no matter how hard they try. So I think by bringing in the housing stock, and the answer to your question is a market-driven answer, right? So as long as there's demand for housing in the city, you will see available capital come to the city to develop housing. Once we get to the point where the market's saturated, then you'll get to the point where you no longer see new projects and the prices will start to come down because there'll be more than enough housing for all of the people that live here and all of the folks that we want to recruit to live here and to work at the businesses 
that are currently headquartered in the city. Well, that's never happened in New York City. It's never happened in LA. So you were basically making a speculation statement, but you came across as if it was an empirical fact, which is not. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, yes. Um, I'll see you now. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Um, and I'm glad you addressed the affordability question because that's among my passions. And I just want to make sure that uh, at some point that the development community can collaborate with the, with the city and to, to create that inventory for that young professional, for that police officer. We just hired 25 new police officers. I'd love for them to be able to live in the city, um, our veterans and our seniors. So I, I'd like to, certainly like to see that happen sooner than later. So uh, to Mr. Moss's point, that, that speculation, but... Do you have any other, um, I guess, examples of where that's happened, where there, you say the market is not quite saturated, but it seems there's an overabundance of uh, market rate housing, but a dearth of affordable housing for those who, who um, can't afford those 1520 and above um, price points? Well, and I think, and I can um, bring uh, the folks up from Breeden, but I think what you'll look at when we talk about market, housing, mm -hmm. the market price for a unit at the oceanfront, let's say, is going to be different from the market price for a unit at, at town center sure. or in this area. Sure. It just depends on, you know, amenities where you're located. So market housing isn't the same price everywhere. Right. I mean, you can't, you know, demand the same market rates that they're getting at the Pearl right now over off a shore drive. Right every place else in the city. So there's a natural variation just based on uh, regular market factors. Uh, but I think as you start to see new products, so there's 200 West, the apartments that were developed in the area nearby. Um, there's this project, there are uh, additional apartments coming on board. But if you look at the, the Pembroke strategic growth area area plan, the, the idea was to have more housing in this particular section of the city. So in that sense, we're um, you know, meeting those aspirational guidelines. Now, is, is that going to change? And you know, we update our comprehensive plan um, you know, every uh, five or so years. So that could change. I mean, we could get to a point where we're saturated and the, and the plan would reflect that. But at this point, there's still demand. There's still the need. Um, could the city and the development community come together to find a way to um, incentivize more affordable housing? That's certainly something that, that can be studied. But right now, given the land prices and the prices of stormwater management, which if you think about it, this property right now, no stormwater management. <coughs> so it's, it's, a, it's an open, indu heavy industrial site. So not only do the, the owners have to, to clear the site, they have to test it, they'll have to remediate any environmental concerns before that, um, before they can even sell it to the breeding companies. And then after that, you know, obviously breeding will have to do the, the up-to-date stormwater management. So the costs of development at this point, in addition to the land costs are tremendous. As the price of land comes down, as the development costs come down, um, and maybe if the city decides to find a way to incentivize uh, more affordable housing, there, you know, there might be a way to do that. But at this point, the price of the land and the price of, you know, all the entirety of the development is really driving the, the, the these be market rate. You know. I, I get that. It's just that there's a certain ir irony that this particular project is right across the street from the Housing Resource Center, those who are having housing challenges. So just wanted to make sure that there is a... Uh, perhaps more thoughtful um, deliberation and more sharpening of the pencil when we start doing these deals moving forward. But it's, I appreciate the effort and the time put into this by Breeden, certainly a, a, a reputable um, a developer. And so we appreciate you wanted to continue to invest in our city. So thank you. Hey, Rosemary. Um, so Lisa, the, the Renaissance project, not the school, but the housing project that uh, Taylor Franklin's doing, isn't that more for workforce housing? I believe it is. I believe that is that it has a HUD component to it. Yeah, it has a HUD component. And so that's across almost across the street from the Housing Resource Center as well. And I don't know how many units they have, but it's a it's a pretty big I believe they're A thirty six as well. So yeah, it'll be um, quite a few units there. But right, but they got HUD financing so that they could provide and I know when they when they developed it. They put out to the teachers, firefighters, to city employees, um, notice first 
that these were coming up before it went out to the public to kind of give them kind of first dibs to get on the list mm -hmm. for this workforce housing. And that's, that's right there, almost across the street. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara? Um, I noticed that uh, the Point of View Elementary School is the school that this would, um, is, in, is the elementary school that's already um, has a, a capacity or, or an enrollment, <coughs> I think, too much greater than its capacity. Uh, and this will add another 33 students, which I think then puts it over that 10% um, range. And with other developments in that area, <coughs> I certainly hope, and I'm assuming, and I'm looking at Mr. Tahan, that we, we have a continuous communication with the schools so that they've got plenty of lead time to know that there's, there's going to be a problem here because I certainly don't think we want to overload our elementary schools. Uh, and this one, this one, I think you all said it looks like it's okay, but I don't agree with that. So I hope you will put this on your list to make sure that Point of View Elementary School is on the radar for the future. Okay, Rocky. And then Aaron. Mr. Mayor and members of council, and thank you. And, and I support this project. And more importantly, what I support is removing this hideous rock pile that's been in the middle of our city for the past umpteen years. And I think that Mr. Mamoudis has already started making a move on it. And I drive by there, and I'm already starting to see it go down, so it's getting done. But it, anybody, and we've heard the testimony here that drives by there, they, they look at that pile of rubble, and it, it's just... It's terrible to have right in the heart of our city, right by the interstate leading into our city. So more importantly, we're getting this pile gone and, and having some, something nice put up there. So I support this project. Okay, thank you. Ma Aaron? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just think this is a, a, a solid um, project in terms of making sure that it is um, housing stock is being replenished and that we can attract a, a workforce that will come in and work in our city. I think um, we talked many a times um, about making sure that those are our first responders and those millennials who who does make up the largest percentage of the workforce in America um, today um, can actually uh, honestly and earnestly look at the city of Virginia Beach as a place to come work and play. I think given its proximity to Town Center, and we all know what our plans are for, for Pembroke and Town Center, um, that this um, this housing will, will serve um, this area and, and be a great benefit to this area. Not to mention the all the work that's gone into redoing and widening the Woodstock Road now that that's somewhat um, complete. Um, and so I think, again, I think it's a solid project um, as well and, and it's one that I'm, I'm happy to support. But I do share uh, Mrs. Miles, uh, Councilwoman uh, member, Woman Miles, um, passion for affordable housing. Uh, and that's just not a Virginia Beach issue. That's an issue we have throughout our country and finding ways that we can work with our developers um, to lessen the cost on building these these uh, affordable units um, to where um, you know we, we can make sure that whether it's the homeless community or those who are at risk of being homeless or those who are just getting a fresh start on life or just leaving the nest can actually get out there and not have all their income go to just solely housing but it can go to, um, to other things as well to, to have a sustainable life um, within our city and in our commonwealth. So I think this is a good start and I'm, I'm happy to support. Okay, uh, wait, we do have another speaker. I'll, I'll hold my remarks to discussion. Okay. Yes, sir, the last speaker is Barbara Messner. Well, here we go. Good evening. I don't know how many people are aware that economic development meets at 8.30 in the morning. I think Mr. Dyer and Ms. Wilson usually attend. And Lisa Murphy is the clerk, and she's with Wilcox Savage. Her official email is, you know, Lisa Murphy at Will Sav. So there's so many conflicts in the city, it's unbelievable. Totally unbelievable. Um, we've had uncontrolled growth, the, the oceanfront. 
I spent a lot of time living at the oceanfront, and I still go to the oceanfront. You're building, that was the um, original city dump. And you've overbuilt so bad that there's nothing but flooding. And the breeding project there, where the farm fresh used to be, even before that started, um, you've been building all these high density projects down there. Uh, that's why traffic is so bad. And, you know, talk about town center. Five parking garages we built for them. The parking garages at the oceanfront. You keep creating the need for more parking, and you let uh, short-term rental people buy. You, you sell parking to them. There's not enough parking for residents. Um, like I said, Breeden, uh, I Fly, Aqua, that was their 25th Street parking lot. That's what um, our ex mayor, Sessoms, that's the one plea deal he did uh, out of five inside trading deals that he was accused of. And like I said, the, the Harris Teeter has sinkholes. There's sinkholes all over that area. So you're not considering, you know, the flooding problems. You're just adding to them. And, um, yeah, there's no, there's, no one can afford anything when the city controls it, including Rudy Loop. You shouldn't be deciding what goes there. You bought property for that in 99, 2000. You paid um, 2000 for something that was valued at 800000 So I oppose the way y'all are running the city and taking out debt. Economic Development Authority doesn't make money. It takes out debt. Like I said, stop corporate welfare. It's not fair that we pay for what, what you decide you want. Thank you. That's all the speakers. Okay, Mr. Moss. Comments, thank you. I think people sometimes take my comments that I'm opposed to a project. Mr. Moss, can you turn your microphone on, take please? Take my comments that I'm opposed to a project, but what I'm opposed to is people misrepresenting the merits of their proposal. That's what concerns me. So let me just share some information that I've been able to obtain. In FY 1718, we brought on 526 apartments onto the tax rolls on July 1st of that book. The mean price of those units appraised by the city assessor was 130,545. That was the average. The median was 139,257. This is on top of the existing stock. These are incremental. In 1819, we added 825 units for our average mean cost of 142,819. And the mean was 100, the median was 158,337. That, that's a real signal of what's going on there. Now, you look at when we brought the Wichita Road pro, pro, apartments on the school sold the property, and I've done the research. This is an FY 1920, and you see that mean dropped to 105,980, and the median was 105,596, and that was 645 apartments. Now, in 2021, we added 683 jumps to 133,000, still lower than 1819, but in FY22, maybe contributing land, stormwater, the mean price was 187,534, and the median was 196,333. The reason why I'm bringing these up is if you look at what investors have to return on that property and the rents that they have to charge, and then you look at the income stratification of our households, millennial, Xers, seniors, whatever it is, maybe military people getting tax-free housing allowance, and I'm sure that rings a bell with investors, can be in those properties. But there's no economic development jobs that we are bringing here that are paying individuals that are single, which a lot of millennials are, not all, that can get that and say, well, that's, that's not more than 30% of my income. I only mention this is because when people talk about affordable housing, the most affordable housing usually is the housing that you already have. 
for the very reasons that you mentioned. Land, cost of money, investors expected return on capital. And then you gotta charge those, so whether it's two or three people living in the apartments. I know in New York they put walls in between the bedrooms and three live in a one bedroom apartment. But people find a way. But we shouldn't be kidding ourselves that there's any indication anywhere where we have increased the supply of housing such that it has dropped the price because the demographics don't support that analysis. So I'm not criticizing your project, but if you've got a good project, don't resort to things that aren't true to make it sound better than it is. We have a real challenge. We have a huge challenge. We're gonna probably see a lot more home share going on than we wanna recognize because people find a way. But the economic development that we're bringing in with rare exceptions doesn't pay the salaries that will get you into a, an apartment that's assessed at $196,333. I don't think anyone would dispute that. So I, I'm just trying to bring a sense of honesty to the discussion of how, in this Muslim, how challenging the issue is of affordable rents. And you can also get your place so expensive that millennials go elsewhere, and Washington, D.C. is experiencing that, New York has experienced that, and middle America is the beneficiary of that. Those are the analysis when you go and look to see the trend has changed. So all I'm asking is for intellectual integrity when people are trying to fix their, just tell it like it is but don't try to suggest to the public that your project's gonna deliver some potential speculative benefit that you aren't willing to sign your name and say, if it doesn't happen, you're gonna send me a check so I can give people a rent subsidy. So I applaud your project. I mean, I understand you're solving a community problem. I'm just asking that we be more honest with the viewing public and with us as to what really is gonna be the benefit. That's all I'm asking. I don't have any complaints about your project. You're trying to accomplish a good. I, obviously, Mr. Taylor doesn't think this property is good industrial property, so even though we say we don't have enough, I'm gonna accept his staff expertise there. But I want the viewing public to know just how big the challenge is in Virginia Beach when they say, <coughs> I want affordable housing. Well, if you looked at all the things that you mentioned, it makes that very difficult, even with HUD tax credits, because then you're only giving 10 to 20% a subsidized or low rent units for the life of the term of the loan. It all depends on which kind of tax credit it is. So I see you got your hand up, Mr. Oh, please do, because I, I, I don't have anything, like I said. I, uh, I wish you would go through me, Mr. Moss, oh, okay. in terms of inviting me I'm back. Sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for just for a minute. I'll, I'm just going to uh, appreciate your comments. I will tell you this, out of uh, probably 10 developers that approached me during this process, as I said, that I was going to pick a role here and make this project go away, nine of them did not want to touch it for the status quo, the mountains and the buildings and getting all that done. The complaints kept coming. You'll ask your staff. They get a complaint every day. Somebody has to answer that complaint. Somebody has to file that complaint. Somebody has to follow up on that complaint. The amount of complaints that came from the city were unbelievable. The city manager told me that. He said, I hear it every day about the complaints. We're solving a problem here. I know it's a benefactor here with the breeding company. They're putting $100 million on this junkyard, this pit, or whatever you want to call it. If that doesn't jumpstart that western side of the big dream that y'all created for the town center. I don't know what else will. But I will say this to you. It's a local developer with a great reputation that has decided to put his money in Virginia Beach and, do the, and, and build the product that he wants to build. The affordable housing, we understand that. The cost of the land is X. Construction has gone through the roof. I was waiting for a, hey, an uncle call from them one day. Hey, things that, I can't control the world, John, we got to roll. These guys have put their toe where, the, where they need to be, and I have a lot of respect for that. But I'm a Virginia Beach guy. I've been here since I, I was in the motel business for years, my parents. I know all about it. I love Virginia Beach. This is going to be a great thing. We're going to look back five years after it's built and look at it and go, we did the right thing. And we are going to do the right thing. So thank First you. First of all, I want to apologize, Mr. Mayor, for okay. not recognizing you. That is an error on my part. I don't take any exception to any of that. I don't take exception that it's a great product. I don't take the exception. 
But what I'm trying to educate the public as they hear this, that, that given the less land that we have, given the price of land, given the cost of stormwater to do all that stuff, we really don't have a path forward any more than New York City does to create housing at our current real wage structure that's affordable for people, which is why people are moving to rentals because all the hedge funds see that we might have gen a whole generation that only rents and the rents are so high they never get the capital to buy. And that's a shift. And I just want to think we got to have a serious discussion about that because that may be that that is what affordable housing is going forward is rental because the cost of capital acquisition is just out of the reach of the productivity and wealth and the real disposable incomes that our economy is doing and the jobs that we can bring in. That was my purpose, not to in any way, Mr. Breeden has developed some great places, but gets back to, I don't want anyone to think that this development is going to materially impact and make affordable housing or lower the price of rents because there's nothing in any forecaster's future that suggests those economic forces are at work. Okay, anyone else at this point? Rocky. Mr. Mayor, I move to approve. Okay. Second. 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 All right, the vote is open. Not yet, just one second. The vote is open. Um, Mr. Tower, may I have your vote? Thank you. And by a vote of 11 to 0, you have approved the application. That's the last thing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we got the vote totals in? Okay. I've, I've stated. Okay. Uh, now, at this point, we have no appointments or any unfinished business? Any new business? Ms. Miles, welcome to the family. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate it. We're adjourned.